hello friends, thank you for joining our study. I just want to say thank you to the Baha'i administration. Uh, please know that this is actually a personal interpretation. It is my opinion and my understanding of the Baha'i writings. Uh, for an official view, please actually refer to the Baha'i writings themselves and jump over to Baha'i.org. Uh, in the description below, you're going to find an MP3 version of this talk, uh, a PDF with all the quotes that are actually being used, and as well, timestamps of the different sections of the talk, so you can always jump ahead or get back to where you were before. And if for any reason you would like to be alerted of upcoming videos, uh, please click subscribe. So today, friends, we're going to be looking at the Great Beyond, a sketch, as I've titled it. And this is an examination of what the Baha'i writings say about the worlds beyond this world. Um, of course, it's only my personal opinion, and this is really just going to be a conversation starter in the hopes of offering to the friends um, a bundle of quotes and a bundle of ideas about how those quotes relate to each other uh, to be used and evolved and, if you will, debated and dialogued on. Uh, I love this first quote, which we're going to read, because of the expression it uses of the great beyond. It is a passage relating to the passing of the greatest holy leaf, the sister of Abdu'l-Baha. A sorrow, reminiscent in its poignancy, of the devastating grief caused by Abdu'l-Baha's sudden removal from our midst, has stirred the Baha'i world to its foundations. The greatest holy leaf, the well-beloved and treasured remnant of Baha'u'llah, entrusted to our frail and unworthy hands by our departed master, has passed to the great beyond, leaving a legacy that time can never dim. The great beyond is such a wonderful phrase uh, to relate to what happens after this life, in my mind, for multiple reasons. First, um, really when we look at the Baha'i writings, the amount of information we have about what the world's beyond this world are like, is just so massive. There's so many quotes. Uh, as you will see, this compilation I'm working from is quite large itself. Um, in addition to that, we actually see how expansive that world is. So there's so many quotes, but at the same time we see how the enormity, if you will, of the great beyond. And third is the duty and obligations, I feel and believe, for the Baha'is to actually first get a very, very clear picture of what the writings of the Bab, Baha'u'llah, Abdu'l-Baha, and Shoghi Effendi say on this matter, and then use them as, if you will, as the materials to build bridges <laughs> between differing beliefs. If you will, between Christianity, for example, and Buddhism, and to see how, while on the surface these might actually appear a divergent, we can, through a deep understanding of the Baha'i writings, see a ways that we can build a bridge between them. Or, if you will, a grander map that will enable us to chart a course from the Kingdom of Christianity to the Kingdom of Buddhism, or from something, again, as seemingly divergent as Hinduism and Islam. This first section we're going to look at an analogy that's often uh, used within uh, the Baha'i writings and in Baha'i discourse, which is the analogy of this world and the next world to the world of the womb, in the belly of the mother, and the world we are currently living in. The world beyond is as different from this world as this world is different from that of the child while still in the womb of its mother. The mysteries of man's physical death and of his return have not been divulged and still remain unread. By the righteousness of God, were they to be revealed, they would evoke such fear and sorrow that some would perish, while others would be so filled with gladness as to wish for death, and beseech with unceasing longing the one true God, exalted be his glory, to hasten their end. Death prefereth unto every confident believer the cup that is life indeed. It bestoweth joy and it is the bearer of gladness. It conferreth the gift of everlasting life. As to those that have tasted of the fruit of man's earthly existence, which is the recognition of the one true God, exalted be his glory, their life hereafter is such as we are unable to describe. The knowledge thereof is with God alone. 
the Lord of all the worlds. So we see that the world beyond is as different from this world as this world is different from that of the child while still in the womb of his mother. And this relates to, as Baha'u'llah said in this, this quote from Gleanings, how actually our there is a veil. There is much that we cannot directly access, directly experience, and directly know about the worlds beyond. And then he says that were it to be revealed, it would evoke fear and sorrow in some, right? While others would be so filled with gladness they would wish for death. And it's, it, it, if you will, I imagine a child being able to see the world that we are currently in, and the reaction of that fetus, if you will, to the enormity or to the responsibility and duty of the world in which we now live, as seen from the womb, and also the degree to which that being had been developed in the womb would relate to these reactions of either fear or exceeding gladness. Um, we're now going to look at a longer passage where Abdu Baha actually expounds upon this analogy of the womb. In the beginning of his human life, man was embryonic in the world of the matrix. There he received capacity and endowment for the reality of human existence. The forces and powers necessary for this world were bestowed upon him in that limited condition. In this world, he needed eyes. He received them potentially in the other. He needed ears. He obtained them there in readiness and preparation for his new existence. The powers requisite in this world were conferred upon him in the world of the matrix. Therefore, in this world, he must prepare himself for the life beyond. That which he needs in the world of the kingdom must be obtained here. Just as he prepared himself in the world of the matrix by acquiring forces necessary in this sphere of existence, so likewise the indispensable forces of the divine existence must be potentially attained in this world. What is he in need of in the kingdom which transcends the life and limitation of this mortal sphere? That world beyond is a world of sanctity and radiance. Therefore, it is necessary that in this world he should acquire these divine attributes. In that world there is need of spirituality, faith, assurance, the knowledge and love of God. These he must attain in this world, so that after his ascension from the earthly to the heavenly kingdom, he shall find all that is needful in that eternal life ready for him. That divine world is manifestly a world of lights. Therefore, man has need of illumination here. That is a world of love. The love of God is essential. It is a world of perfections. Virtues or perfections must be acquired. That world is vivified by the breasts of the Holy Spirit. In this world we must seek them. That is the kingdom of everlasting life. It must be attained during this vanishing existence. By what means can man acquire these things? How shall he obtain these merciful gifts and powers? First, through the knowledge of God. Second, through the love of God. Third, through faith. Fourth, through philanthropic deeds. Fifth, through self-sacrifice. Sixth, through severance from this world. Seventh, through sanctity and holiness. Unless he acquires these forces and attains to these requirements, he will surely be deprived of the life that is eternal. But if he possesses the knowledge of God, becomes ignited through the fire of the love of God, witnesses the great and mighty signs of the kingdom, becomes the cause of love among mankind, and lives in the utmost state of sanctity and holiness, he shall surely attain to second birth, be baptized by the Holy Spirit, and enjoy everlasting existence. We are told here in this passage that just as in the womb of our mother, the limbs and sense organs necessary for the navigation of this world had to be developed, and they would either help or hinder 
the degree to which we can interact with this plane of existence. And that just that we needed to develop there, in the womb for this world, we have to develop certain facets, capacities, and qualities for the coming world now. We ourselves, if you will, are actually building a fetus, a child-like body for ourselves to inhabit in the next world. And it's interesting that very often, when at least I've experienced, say in firesides or dialogues where Baha'is are, uh, if you will, sharing this beautiful analogy, and a very rich analogy with many <laughs> facets that we can tease out, um, they'll say, and these, the way we develop these bodies, the way we develop the limbs is through love, through kindness, through patience. Um, and these are all true. The, the list will be a list of virtues. But I think it's important to notice that that list is actually quite a bit more comprehensive um, within the writings and talks of Abdu'l-Baha. We see, for example, the need of spirituality, faith, assurance, the knowledge, and the love of God. It's these things that we must actually develop. And it says, knowledge of God, love of God, faith, philanthropic deeds, self-sacrifice, severance from this world, sanctity and holiness. And in each of these cases, he's numbering them. He's trying to give us a much more comprehensive list, but it means that um, whatever analogy we have, we have to make sure that we expand upon how we represent what Abdu'l-Baha is saying here. We need to have the knowledge of God in the next world. And part of that will relate to our ability to maintain certitude in God, faith, in the next world. To still have to place trust just as we do here. And it's interesting because often it's, it can be represented in pictures of the great beyond, if you will, that we won't need faith, that we won't need assurance, that we won't need severance from this world. These are themes that are going to keep coming up as we move forward, because I believe the more and more we interact with the Pi writings, we see that this list and structure, these, these qualities that we need, are not limited purely to being a good person. There's a great deal more, and we'll see them come up quite shortly. Here is a quote from Abdu'l-Baha. The answer to the third question is this, that in the other world the human reality doth not assume a physical form. Rather doth it take on a heavenly form, made up of elements of that heavenly realm. Uh, it is often stated, actually, again within discussions and dialogues, that we do not have a physical form in the next world. And uh, Abdu'l-Baha in this passage clearly states this, uh, the human reality doth not assume a physical form, rather it takes on a heavenly form. But it still has a form. And then he adds that it actually has elements of that heavenly realm. And in some sense, however we understand this, that world beyond has elements to it. And the form that is actually being built for us to inhabit, that development that we're actually having, is made up of the elements of that world. And this becomes clearer as we move on. The question was then asked as to how it would be possible with no material bodies or environment to recognize different entities and characters when all would be in the same conditions and on the same plane of existence. Abdu'l-Baha said if several people look into a mirror at the same moment, they behold all the different personalities, their characteristics and movements. The glass of the mirror into which they look is one. In your mind you have a variety of thoughts, but all these thoughts are separate and distinct. Also you may perhaps have hundreds of friends, but when you call them before your memory, you do not confuse them one with another. Each one is separate and distinct, having their own individualities and characteristics. In this passage, some of the examples that Abdu'l-Baha uses are quite fascinating. Because the question is being asked how it is that if we have no material bodies, that we can actually recognize different entities and characters. And then he gives the example first here of actually in a mirror. When you're looking at a mirror, say you're in a grand party, <laughs> right, a huge social gathering, and you're looking at a mirror along the wall, you see actually all these different figures. But what, in some sense, is the elemental substance of what you're seeing in the mirror? Really, in much sense, the same thing you would if you were to turn around 
which is they're made up of photons. You're actually only, the, the mirror itself is one, the reflective surface is one, what is being transmitted to you is actually one, photons, light, and yet you can still discern that there are different characters. So even though the elements in that world might not be like this world, there is still a fully a ability to discern different pairs, personalities, and characters. He then says if you have a variety of thoughts, for example, I myself can be thinking about what I have to do tomorrow. I could also be thinking about a Superman comic that I was reading, right? And I can be jumbling these two and not think that tomorrow I have something to do, which is to be Superman. I myself can actually look at what often are referred to as abstract objects or abstract entities. We can actually have, say, a story of Sherlock Holmes and then a story of Aesop's fables of the turtle and the hare, and we don't suddenly confuse these two fictional stories into one. We can understand that the story of Batman is not the same, say, as Plato's allegory of the cave, <laughs> two which I would suggest abstract objects, one generally being for fun, and the other one actually being a philosophical treatise through metaphoric language. But we do not actually mash them together. We are able to discern between them. And then I think this is a hint as to what some of the elemental substances of that world beyond actually are, because we are using images and intellectual abstract concepts. And when we, the third example he gives is actually memory, that we can recall these friends, these hundreds of friends, and in the world of our own mind, of our own consciousness, they do not crush together. It is manifest that beyond this material body, man is endowed with another reality, which is the world of exemplars constituting the heavenly body of man. This other and inner reality is called the heavenly body, this ethereal form which corresponds to this body. This is the conscious reality which discovers the inner meaning of things. For the outer body of man does not discover anything. The inner ethereal reality grasps the mysteries of existence, discovers scientific truths, and indicates their technical application. It discovers electricity, produces the telegraph, the telephone, and opens the door to the world of arts. If the outer material body did this, the animal would likewise be able to make scientific and wonderful discoveries. For the animal shares with man all physical powers and limitations. What then is that power which penetrates the realities of existence and which is not to be found in the animal? It is the inner reality which comprehends things, throws light upon the mysteries of life and being, discovers the heavenly kingdom, unseals the mysteries of God, and differentiates man from the brute. Of this there can be no doubt. So there is a world of exemplars that constitutes the heavenly body of man. That's just directly what the quote says. And this heavenly body, the ethereal form which corresponds to this body. We're often told that um, this physical frame which we have is actually itself as if a mirror reflecting the soul of humanity, my individual soul. And it says that this, this reality is what grasps the mysteries of existence, discovers scientific truths, and indicates their technical applications. And I find this fascinating uh, because it, re and it relates very heavily to the Baha'i writings and their relationship to the relation their exposition of the relationship between religion and science, because in the Baha'i faith science is seen as sacred, a holy obligation actually. And in this context we're being told that it is part of our ethereal body, part of the attributes of our ethereal body. And he says later that this inner, inner reality which comprehends things, throws light upon the mysteries of life and being, <laughs> discovers the heavenly kingdom, unseals the mysteries of God, and it is that which differentiates man from the brute. That we actually have reflected here that there, we have a, exemplars within us that constitute right, our heavenly body in the next world. 
And I think it's really important to attend to the examples that he gives immediately after to get a sense of what these exemplars might be like. One is actually just knowledge. The other is the knowledge of the world, of being itself, of life. Then it moves on to discovering the heavenly kingdoms. That there is a the elemental heavenly body that we have is in some ways related to these activities. That it's about discovering the world of the kingdom, realizing that there is a world of the heavenly kingdom, and then unsealing the mysteries of God. And I would suggest this is actually looking at understanding our world, understanding ourselves, discovering that there is a world beyond this realm of abstractions, this realm of divine realities, then actually seeking, recognizing, and actually then unsealing the mysteries of God, and that this is what makes us truly human. The following is a quote from Memorials of the Faithful. I loved him very much, for he was delightful to converse with, and as a companion second to none. One night, not long ago, I saw him in the world of dreams. Although his frame had always been massive, in the dream world he appeared larger and more corpulent than ever. It seemed as if he had returned from a journey. I said to him, Jinab, you have grown good and stout. Yes, he answered. Praise be to God. I have been in places where the air was fresh and sweet and the water crystal pure. The landscapes were beautiful to look upon, the foods delectable. It all agreed with me, of course, so I am stronger than ever now, and I have recovered the zest of my early youth. The breasts of the all-merciful blew over me, and all my time was spent in telling of God. I have been setting forth his proofs and teaching his faith. The meaning of teaching the faith in the next world is spreading the sweet saviors of holiness. That action is the same as teaching. We spoke together a little more, and then some people arrived, and he disappeared. What is happening in this passage? Uh, Abdul Baha tells us, and it's interesting, he says that uh, in the world of dreams, he ac actually witnessed this truly faithful servant, Mullah Ali Akbar. He's, and the portrayal he gives of this figure is very much like here. He speaks, for example, of landscapes, of air and water, if you will, of elemental substance and structure around Mullah Ali Akbar. That is the report in the Memorials of the Faithful. And then he actually speaks of this in the relationship of the world of dreams, where we definitely can <laughs> encounter and experience both our consciousness, other entities, which we can differentiate them from each other, and then uh, travel through landscapes in a form. And he says that in this, and this is something that's going to come up quite a bit later, that he says that he's teaching. That this is actually what Mullah Ali Akbar is doing. He actually says that he is setting forth his proofs and teaching the faith. And I want us all to keep this very much in mind. Mullah Ali Akbar, an entity who has moved into the great beyond, is putting forward proofs of Baha'u'llah's mission. This question of our heavenly body we will return to, or now we're going to move on to some simple general questions that often come up. So in this section, are we, are we reunited with our loved ones? Uh, in this first passage that we've read um, from his messages to the Indian subcontinent. Dear spiritual brother, Shoghi Effendi wishes me to acknowledge the receipt of both your letters dated August 6, 1926. He was most grieved to learn of the great sorrow that has befallen Mrs. Vakil and yourself. A child is undoubtedly the most precious material object a person can possess, and to see it pass away is an irreparable loss to be deeply lamented. We should, however, 
remember the promises we are given of the world to come, and picturing to ourselves the greater spiritual development the departed ones obtain. Comfort ourselves and patiently await our reunion there. Shoghi Effendi wishes me to express to both Mrs. Vakil and yourself his heartfelt condolences and assure you of the share he bears of this sad loss. We are told that we have a reunion with our loved ones, and that our loved ones, when they pass from this life, actually continue to have spiritual development in those worlds beyond. Mrs. S. asked some questions with reference to the conditions of existence in the next world and the life after death. She said that having recently lost a very near relative, she had given much thought to this subject. Many thought that reunion with those we had loved and who had passed on to the future life would only take place after a long period of time had elapsed. She wished to know whether one would be reunited with those who had gone before immediately after death. Abdul Baha answered that this would depend upon the respective stations of the two. If both had the same degree of development, they would be reunited immediately after death. The questioner then said, How could this state of development be acquired? Abdul Baha replied, By unceasing effort, striving to do right, and to attain spiritual qualities. The second passage is more interesting because it says that the reunion that we have actually with people who have passed on into the next world, quote, depend upon the respective stations of the two. If both have the same degree of development, they be would be reunited immediately, after death. And it's interesting that it's stated that this is related to our ability to have unceasing effort, right, to do right and attain spiritual qualities. So on the one hand, we get reunited with our loved ones, and on the other, we also have this issue that it, that reunion relates somehow to the development of the respective stations of the two individuals. And again, this is just something that I want us to actually keep in mind as we move forward. There is a reunion, but that reunion has some relationship to our development and the degree of development of that loved one. Replying to another questioner, he said that when two people, husband and wife for instance, have been completely united in this life, their souls being as one soul, then after one of them has passed away, there, this union of heart and soul would remain unbroken. This final quote in this section, and again we're just trying to begin to uh, keep a mental catalog of many of the nodes or notions or ideas that are coming up. Um, here it actually says that the when two people, husband and wife, have been completely united in this life, and I want to highlight this, then that unit of heart and soul would remain unbroken. That this is a different way of looking at respective stations. That in some sense, the, re the reunion of ourselves with another soul, in a sense, is based upon the union we actually had in this life and our respective stations. And keep this in mind as we move forward. Those who have passed on through death have a sphere of their own. It is not removed from ours. Their work, the work of the kingdom, is ours. But it is sanctified from what we call time and place. Time with us is measured by the sun. When there is no more sunrise and no more sunset, that kind of time does not exist for man. Those who have ascended have different attributes from those who are still on earth, yet there is no real separation. Another question that often arises in connection with discussions about the, the great beyond, the next world, is the question of time and place. And we see actually um, in, the, in the reference about Mullah Ali Akbar that there is a movement, a moving around. The analogies that are actually being used of a mirror, that in a sense we can see in the world of dreams, that there can be 
if you will, movement without movement. Because, and I believe these only to be analogies, but we're being shown that, yes, this world has elements, just like that world, right? They actually both have elements, they are of a different nature. And I think here we're being told that, once again, it is not like our time. There is an analogue, if you will, to our time. Because he says, time of us is measured by the sun, but if there's no more sunset or sunrise, that kind of time does not exist for man. And that those who have ascended have different attributes, right, than those that are on earth. So is there a passage of time? I would suggest, of course there is. Is it reckoned how we reckon it? By the passage of the sun, by hours? No. Um, and again, as an analogy, you can see that time even within the world of dreams, if you remember many of them, can be radically different. Time can move swiftly and then slow down, but there is still a procession of what happened first, what happened second, and what happened third. Just as we don't confuse the images in our mind, for example, of the different characters in fictional novels, just as we don't confuse them in the image of the mirror, we do not confuse the chronology of events even if it is marked by a different meter. I can actually think of Napoleon and think of my mother, for example, and have these two figures in my mind and still know chronologically one came long before the other. In the notion of us being above, for lack of a better phrase, uh, this world, in the beyond, uh, our relationship with that feature of reality will actually be different. Just like our relationship to the world of the plant kingdom is different if we're a human, an animal, or a plant. The way we can manipulate it, the way we can interact with it is radically, radically different at each of those stages. The mineral can only feed it, the animal can eat it, while well, we can modify them. The light which these souls radiate is responsible for the progress of the world and the advancement of its peoples. They are like unto leaven which leaveneth the world of being, and constitute the animating force through which the arts and wonders of the world are made manifest. Through them the clouds rain their bounty upon men, and the earth bringeth forth its fruits. All things must needs have a cause a motive power, an animating principle. These souls and symbols of detachment have provided, and will continue to provide, the supreme moving impulse in the world of being. I love this quote because it relates again to the sciences, but also the arts. And we're told that the light radiated from those souls who have ascended fosters the development of the arts and sciences. But also that, and I love the way it's put, they have provided and will continue to provide the supreme moving impulse in the world of being. Holy souls have provided this life and will provide the supreme moving impulse. That again we see this analogy that in the story we saw of Mullah Ali Akbar, that that which we do in this world has its resemblances with that, elements and elements, landscapes and landscapes, ways of drinking even, that there is time and time, and that although they are not identical, they are, if you will, um, images of each other, reflections of each other, and that in the next world we will continue to actually interact with arts and sciences. So now we're going to be going into where often discussions about the world beyond get slightly uncomfortable, which has to do with judgment and the concepts of heaven and hell. The souls of the infidels, however, shall, and to this I bear witness, when breathing their last, be made aware of the good things that have escaped them, and shall bemoan their plight, and shall humble themselves before God. They shall continue doing so after the separation of their souls from their bodies. It is clear and evident that all men shall, after their physical death, estimate the worth of their deeds and realize all that their hands have wrought. I swear by the day star 
that shineth above the horizon of divine power. They that are the followers of the one true God shall, the moment they depart out of this life, experience such joy and gladness as would be impossible to describe. While they that live in error shall be seized with such fear and trembling and shall be filled with such consternation as nothing can exceed. Well is it with him that hath quaffed the choice and incorruptible wine of faith through the gracious favor and the manifold bounties of him who is the Lord of all faiths. So uh, in this passage, Baha'u'llah tells us that we will be made aware of the good things that have escaped us and bemoan our plight. If we are, and the term used is infidel. I want to address this term because uh, it's not commonly used in the Baha'i writings, but it is something that is uh, evokes a lot of emotion. So before we move forward, I'd like to address it. Uh, what is an infidel? Um, the association we have is very, very harsh, when its actual term simply means infidelity. One who has not kept a trust, one who has not kept a covenant. So it's important that when we encounter it, um, that we try to understand what it actually means, as opposed to the terrible things we often think of. Because it means that we ourselves had a marriage, if you will. We ourselves had a covenant of love and trust and union with one that we have broken. In a sense, we have broken a covenant with the purpose for which we have been created. A bond of love and union between humanity and God, and humanity and humanity. Uh, in this passage, it is very clear that there is a judgment, and that it is, if you will, visceral. One will see the things, and it says the good things that have escaped them, bemoan their plight, whereas others will experience such joy and gladness that it would be impossible to describe, and that they live in error be seized with such fear and trembling. So there is an event, and again, I know of no religion really that does not include this concept, that there is an event that when we move from this world to the world beyond, uh, there is a reckoning. We are held to account for the things that we did or didn't do in this life. By God, wert thou to realize what thou hast done, Thou wouldst surely weep sore over thyself, and wouldst flee for refuge to God, and wouldst pine away and mourn all the days of thy life, till God will have forgiven thee, for he verily is the most generous, the all-bountiful. Thou wilt, however, persist till the hour of thy death in thy heedlessness. Inasmuch as thou hast with all thine heart thine soul and inmost being, busied thyself with the vanities of the world. Thou shalt, after thy departure, discover what we have revealed unto thee, and shalt find all thy doings recorded in the book, wherein the works of all them that dwell on earth, be they greater or less than the weight of an atom, are noted down. This other quote just simply tells us once again, that they will see all that has been revealed and find all their doings recorded in a book. That we really are going to face the choices we made in this life. This is actually why Baha'u'llah says in the Hidden Words, O Son of Being, bring thyself to account each day, ere thou art summoned to a reckoning, for death, unheralded, shall come upon thee, and thou shalt be called to give account for thy deeds." In this passage, he's telling us to bring ourself to account. And it's something often that I, I think people forget in the writings of Baha'u'llah, that we are asked to take account of our deeds every day. And because we are going to be brought towards a reckoning. So the more mindful, the more uh, aware and conscious we are, 
of our deeds, and if you will, the value of our deeds, the degree of value hierarchy, the either high or low nature that is being expressed, this will enable us to avoid having to take account of our deeds when we pass. While the judgment um, of God, and I would propose the judgment of ourselves, uh, is a real aspect of our passage from one world to the next, um, there's an important principle that I think we should take note of. Worship thou God in such wise, that if thy worship lead thee to fire, no alteration in thy adoration would be produced. And so likewise, if thy recompense should be paradise, thus and thus alone should be the worship which befitteth the one true God. Shouldst thou worship him because of fear, this would be unseemly in the sanctified court of his presence, and could not be regarded as an act by thee dedicated to the oneness of his being. Or if thy gaze should be on paradise, and thou should worship him while cherishing such a hope, thou wouldst make God's creation a partner with him, notwithstanding the fact that paradise is desired by many. Fire and paradise both bow down and prostrate themselves before God. That which is worthy of his essence is to worship him for his sake, without fear of fire or hope of paradise. Although when true worship is offered, the worshipper is delivered from the fire and entereth the paradise of God's good pleasure. Yet such should not be the motive of his act. However, God's favor and grace ever flow in accordance with the ex exigencies of his inscrutable wisdom. This quote from the Bob is beautiful because it speaks of how if we were to worship God in hope of heaven, or of fear of fire, that this would make God's creation, the worlds of God beyond, and the states and conditions we can occupy, a partner with him. This again in itself is a very, very, very rich notion, and a, I believe, a deep philosophical principle, possibly to be explore, explored later. But it's important that we understand that though judgment may exist, it is not that we act out justice and mercy and compassion, or seek God and seek love and seek knowledge of the divine world and to spread his fragrances everywhere for the rewards of the next life. And that we don't avoid lying and vulgarity and the hurting of another human soul because we will be punished for it. It's actually to be done, right, for its own sake. For example, you naturally hope uh, for your, the love and gratitude of your children. You want them to love you and to reciprocate, but you yourself serve them and sacrifice aspects of your life, and potentially even your literal life, for them, not so you can get that love back from them. It is just the beauty of love and justice and mercy and serving another being that drives a true parent's sentiment. Likewise, in this case, when you see, for example, um, say you wanted to be a, an amazing violinist, and that's what you hoped for, and you get praised by your teacher, and you actually get sort of scolded when you don't do what you're supposed to be doing or living up to your potential, you're actually learning the violin for the beauty of the violin itself and for the expression of that music, I believe, if you're an elevated psyche. <laughs> And while you might get judgment and reward from your teacher, it's not the reason that you go to violin lessons. So we now move on to the notion of heaven and hell. Is there a hell? There is a hell in Baha'i scripture. The word hell. And there is a hell um, pretty much in every revelation that I know, and the concept of a place of punishment, or a state of punishment. I've heard Baha'i say we don't believe in hell at certain times, and I do understand why that might be said. Because the individual 
that we're speaking to has a definition of what that word means. Just like the definition of infidel. It comes packed with all these ideas. But the definition of what that is in the scriptures is a different question compared to how we have defined it in our mind. So at times it's difficult, someone will say to me, do you believe in hell? And I kind of, oh, okay, I have a sigh because, well, the, what you're asking me is, do I believe in a picture that you currently have in your mind that you attach the word hell to? <laughs> and if I answer with a simple yes, and I've had individuals as I begin to answer say, I just want to know yes or no. But if I say yes to them, the answer is yes to the picture and understanding that you have in your mind. Because you're asking the definition of hell, do you believe that? So the Baha'i definition of hell and heaven is actually very, very rich, philosophically and spiritually. So, but in the end, is there the word hell? <laughs> and do we believe in it? Yes. What that is, we're going to explore. Were these people to shake off the slumber of negligence and realize that which their hands have wrought, they would surely perish and would of their own accord cast themselves into fire, their end and real abode. This first quote, however, has a very fascinating aspect that relates to this state of judgment that we were just looking at. And it said, they would of their own accord cast themselves into fire, their end and real abode. Two things, one, that in the state and process of, an, of a being actually advancing uh, into the worlds beyond, that when faced with what they had done, they would cast them, their own selves into the fire. And I would suggest this is because they are actually seeing the reality that they are, the true capacity of their being, whether that uh, process of judgment being an instant and forgotten or stretched out through time, um, the soul comes to a place where it realizes what it has done, the true implications of what it has done, and would judge itself. And it's interesting here because it says their end and real abode. And I think these are two different things. <laughs> one is uh, where they will be, and one is, as I think we will see, where they have already come from. What I desire, however, O oh my God, is that thou shouldst bid me unveil the things which lie hid in thy knowledge, so that they who are wholly devoted to thee may, in their longing for thee, soar up into the atmosphere of thy oneness, and the infidels may be seized with trembling and may return to the nethermost fire, the abode ordained for them by thee through the power of thy sovereign might. So here in this passage from Baha'u'llah and Prayers and Meditations, again we see the term infidel. Um, and we've looked at this already. But I think what's important here is it says, they may be seized with trembling and return to the nethermost fire. It's not that they're actually going into the nethermost fire. That they may seize, be seized with trembling and return to their real abode in the end, if you will. In order to, to better understand this, I think we have to look at what is heaven and what is hell. There is certainly a future life. Heaven and hell are conditions within our own beings. So hell, heaven and hell are states of being. They are not something external to us. They are conditions within our own beings. What is this paradise of heaven and hell? The Bob. I affirm that no paradise is more sublime for my creatures than to stand before my face and to believe in my holy words. While no fire has been or will be fiercer for them than to be veiled from the manifestation of my exalted self and to disbelieve in my words. I think it's really important often that when we encounter concepts within Baha'i writings or any writings, that when we have something definitional like this, we don't pass very quickly over it. What does the Bob say here? There is no paradise more sublime 
So no paradise is more sublime than to believe in his words and stand before his face. And it says, no fire hath been or will be fiercer. So there is no fire that you can think of that has been or will be fiercer than being veiled from the manifestation of God. So whenever you begin to think of some paradise more sublime, when you encounter the concept of paradise, or in any image of hell, there is no fire that hath been or ever will be fiercer than separation from the real purpose of one's existence and union with the Beloved. And again, the Bob says, There is no paradise more wondrous for any soul than to be exposed to God's manifestation in his day, to hear his verses and believe in them, to attain his presence, which is not but the presence of God, to sail upon the sea of the heavenly kingdom of his good pleasure, and to partake of the choice fruits of the paradise of his divine oneness. Is there a paradise more wondrous than being exposed to God's manifestation in his day? And it says, like Ruhi, no, there is no paradise more wondrous. Once again, that heaven is not a place, it is a state and condition within our own being. They say, where is paradise and where is hell? Say, the one is reunion with me, the other thine own self. O thou who dost associate a partner with God, and doubtest. Here in Baha'u'llah's writings, he says, Where is paradise and one, where is hell? One is reunion, the other is your own self. And now this is a notion that actually, I think, comes up over and over and over again when we do studies of the state and station of the human being itself. We are, in our true self, a reflection of the divine being. Of the manifestation of God. That manifestation of God itself is actually a image, the perfect image of the Supreme Deity. And we can either polish the mirror, an analogy he often uses in the Baha'i writings and others, and see the image of that light, or we can look to the frame of the mirror and actually ignore the light it is. That our own will, our own, if you will, base or lower nature, is hell here. Whereas that actual good pleasure or reunion with God, coming to a realization of our true self, is heaven. It's not how we go to heaven, it is heaven. As to paradise, it is a reality and there can be no doubt about it. And now in this world, it is realized through love of me and my good pleasure. Whosoever attaineth unto it, God will aid him in this world below, and after death he will enable him to gain admittance into paradise, whose vastness is as that of heaven and earth. So Baha'u'llah is telling us that this um, paradise is actually realized through love of God, Love of God's manifestation and his good pleasure. O ye lovers of God, be kind to all peoples. Care for every person. Do all ye can to purify the hearts and minds of men. Strive ye to gladden every soul. To every meadow be a shower of grace. To every tree the water of life. Be as sweet musk to the sense of humankind and to the alien be a fresh, restoring breeze. Be pleasing water to all those who thirst, a careful guide to all who have lost their way. Be father and mother to the orphan, be loving sons and daughters to the old, be an abundant treasure to the poor. Think ye of love and good fellowship as the delights of heaven, Think ye of hostility and hatred as the torments of hell. Once again, 
We have here from the writings of Abdu Baha a beautiful poetic verse, and he tells us that we are to think of love and good fellowship as the delights of heaven, his good pleasure, embodying the light of the sun in the mirror of our own self, and hostility and hatred as the torments of hell. And I would suggest again these are the same themes, the separation. I know there's a famous Zen story where actually a samurai is walking through the forest and he comes upon a monk and he starts mocking this monk. Um, and when actually he says to this monk, you know, well, why don't you show me the world beyond paradise of heaven, you know, and show me hell if what you say is true. And the monk looks at him and he actually just begins insulting him, calling him a fool, a moron, a lazy. And all of a sudden this uh, warrior actually gets furious and he pulls out his sword. And then as soon as he has all this rage and anger on his face, the monk says, there is hell. And in this moment, the, the warrior actually realizes that actually the hostility and aggression and hatred and anger are themselves the definition of hell. That he lives in torment in such a state. And in this moment, he realizes the beauty of the Buddhist teachings and has a sense of inner peace. And the monk says, and this is heaven. But this is a famous story, again, long, long predating the Baha'i uh, definition. And we have other examples all throughout other scriptures and, if you will, parables. And it's this is what we're supposed to be trying to understand. That it's not that there is some other hell that we go to being separated from the very purpose of our existence. Uh, that is the hell that we're already in. Through these rewards, he gains spiritual birth and becomes a new creature. He becomes the manifestation of the verse in the gospel where it is said of the disciples that they weren't born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. That is to say, they were delivered from the animal characteristics and qualities which are the characteristics of human nature and they became qualified with the divine characteristics, which are the bounty of God. This is the meaning of the second birth. For such people there is no greater torture than being veiled from God, and no more severe punishment than sensual vices, dark qualities, lowness of nature, engrossment in carnal desires. When they are delivered through the light of faith from the darkness of these vices and become illuminated with the radiance of the sun of reality and ennobled with all the virtues, they esteem this the greatest reward and they know it to be the true paradise. In the same way they consider that the spiritual punishment, that is to say the torture and punishment of existence is to be subjected in the, to the world of nature, to be veiled from God, to be brutal and ignorant, to fall into carnal lust, to be absorbed in animal frailties, to be characterized with dark qualities, such as falsehood, tyranny, cruelty, attachment to the affairs of the world, and being immersed in satanic ideas. For them, these are the greatest punishments and tortures. Likewise, the rewards of the world are the eternal life, which is clearly mentioned in all the holy books, the divine perfections, the eternal bounties, and everlasting felicity. The rewards of the other world are the perfections and the peace obtained in the spiritual worlds after leaving this world. Whilst the rewards of this life are the real luminous perfections which are realized in this world and which are the cause of eternal life, for they are the very progress of existence. It is like the man who passes from the embryonic world to the state of maturity and becomes the manifestation of these words, Blessed be God, the best of creators. The rewards of the other world are peace, the spiritual graces, the various spiritual gifts in the kingdom of God, the gaining of the desires of the heart and the soul, 
and the meeting of God in the world of eternity. In the same way, the punishments of the other world, that is to say, the torments of the other world, consist in being deprived of the special divine blessings and the absolute bounties and falling into the lowest degrees of existence. He who is deprived of these divine favors, although he continues after death, is considered as dead by the people of truth. In this passage, Abdu'l-Baha talks about the second birth, our recreation, if you will, into the spiritual perfections when one recognizes the manifestation of God. And he says that to such people, uh, quote, no greater torture than being veiled from God, no more severe punishment than sensual vices, dark qualities, lowliness of nature, engrossment in carnal desires. And again, is there any more severe punishment? Just answering the quote, no, there is not. <laughs> and as it continues, that the rewards of this world are the perfections and the peace, the real luminous perfections, which are realized in this world. That there is a heaven and hell isn't something over there, some place we go to, but rather as a state or being, a state of being or condition of our own selves. I know for myself, I've often thought of having, you know, if you had two identical twins and they're both standing on the main street of a city, and these two brothers grew up together, and one of the brothers himself has dedicated his life, let's say, to the arts, which are the sciences. He strives to, I don't know, uplift the soul of every person that he meets in his life. He serves his community, tries to promote global integration. His life is really focused and directed towards all of that which is beautiful and valuable in this life. And now standing beside him on this street corner is his identical twin brother, shoulder to shoulder, and this brother of his actually runs a prostitution ring. This individual sells methamphetamines, heroin, and crack cocaine. This individual will at any time utilize his physical prowess through violence, his voice in anger and manipulation, that every facet of his life is actually turned towards selfish and sensual desires. His, the qualities of justice, of mercy, and compassion are injustice, of being neglectful really of everything that he possibly could have been in a process of bettering the world through bettering himself. In a sense, I guess by definition, the one brother is in heaven and the one brother is in hell. It's the state or condition of these psyches. Now one might turn and say, well, but this brother doesn't feel he is in hell. This is a theme that's going to come up quite quickly. No, he doesn't know he's in hell, but he is actually caged in his lower nature. His true self, if you will, that image of divine light that can be reflected in the person of our own selves, has actually been clouded over, not with dust, but with mud, just covered and drenched so that it cannot be seen. And it's, it's interesting, I put them in my mind in, on you know, shoulder to shoulder and identical twins because physically they look the same. In location, they're almost as, as actually close as they can be. But the least important thing about these individuals is that they're standing side by side and they look identical. They are actually, I would suggest, worlds apart. They actually inhabit different worlds. One of anger, of hatred, of manipulation, of selfishness, and a lack of caring for the hearts, minds, bodies, and souls of others. The other in a world where what is real to him, if you will, is actually the virtues, knowledge, and the progress of humankind. This next quote is from Abdu'l-Baha. The root cause of wrongdoing is ignorance, and we must therefore hold fast to the tools of perception and knowledge. Good character must be taught, light must be spread afar, so that, in the school of humanity, all may acquire the heavenly characteristics of the Spirit, and see for themselves beyond any doubt 
that there is no fiercer hell, no more fiery abyss, than to possess a character that is evil and unsound, no more darksome pit, nor loathsome torment, than to show forth qualities which deserve to be condemned. The individual must be educated to such a high degree that he would rather have his throat cut than tell a lie, and would think it easier to be slashed with a sword or pierced with a spear than to utter calumny or be carried away by wrath. In this passage we again meet this definition that there is no fiercer hell, no more fiery abyss, than to possess a character that is evil and unsound. And that I, I often in, in deep things will say to, that we please really, really try and understand what is being said here. Not just understand conceptually, but emotionally. These are the two brothers standing on the street corner. That actually there is no more fiercer hell, no more fiery abyss than the one that brother is in at that moment. And the gravity of actually this, this um, the real station of humankind, why Baha'u'llah says we wish to cast away our life if we were to actually see the true beauty of what we can actually be, is actually reflected in the imageries of heaven and hell. And in here, uh, the individual must be educated to such a high degree that he would rather have his throat cut than tell a lie. This is a very graphic image, as often images of hell can be in certain scriptures. It's trying to impress indelibly, sorry, it's trying to impress indelibly on the heart and mind of humankind how horrid it is for when we are capable of soaring in the skies to rither and flither in the dust. As to thy question, doth every soul without exception achieve life everlasting? Know thou that immortality belongeth to these souls, in whom hath been breathed the spirit of life from God. All save these are lifeless, they are the dead, even as Christ hath explained in the Gospel text. He whose eyes the Lord hath opened will see the souls of men in stations they will occupy after their release from the body. He will find the living ones thriving within the precincts of their Lord, and the dead sunk down in the lowest abyss of perdition. Know thou that every soul is fashioned after the nature of God, each being pure and holy at his birth. Afterwards, however, the individuals will vary according to what they acquire of virtues or vices in this world. Although all existent beings are in their very nature created in ranks or degrees, for capacities are various, nevertheless, every individual is born holy and pure, and only thereafter may he become defiled. And further, although the degrees of being are various, yet all are good. Observe the human body, its limbs, its members, the eye, the ear, the organs of smell, of taste, the hands, the fingernails. Notwithstanding the differences among all these parts, each one, within the limitations of its own being, participateth in a coherent whole. So in the first paragraph of this passage, this is a definition that we see, and as it's stated, um, within the Gospels, the New Testament, uh, let the dead bury their dead, is the famous quote when an individual wants to go back and settle some of his affairs. Um, the dead here is not referring to physical death, uh, just as fire, as we see, is not re actually referring to physical fire, but rather we're looking at a definition that when we are not alive to the reality that is truly within us, we are dead. We might be physically alive, but we have turned our mirror from the sun towards the cold reaches of space, away from light, and are not reflecting the true beauties. And I want to stress again, knowledge, 
by understanding the realities of our universe, as we saw previously, really expressing all the fragrances, if you will, of the human condition in knowledge and love and justice and compassion, self-sacrifice, philanthropic deeds, each of these. Um, and he says that he whose eyes have opened, right, the Lord has opened, quote, will see the souls of men in the stations they will occupy after their release from the body. He will find the living ones thriving within the precincts of their Lord and the dead sunk down in the lowest abyss of perdition. And I think it's interesting because he says, for one whose eyes have opened, he will see the souls of men, right, in the stations they will occupy after their death. And there's two ways to read this. One is that you'll actually see what they will be like later, but you don't see it now. Meaning it's not here. Or we can say he will see in this moment the station they will occupy after they die. Meaning the station they are currently occupying is the same station they're going to occupy, which is being in the depths of perdition in hell, for which there is no fiercer hell or fire more abysmal, if you will, which is the station of being encaged or imprisoned within one's lower nature and not even aware that we actually have one. You are witnessing it on the, on the plane of history now, what you shall witness there. A soul not aware of the manifestation of God, of God, and therefore of his own nature. As to paradise, it is a reality, and there can be no doubt about it. And now in this world it is realized through love of me and my good pleasure. Whosoever attaineth unto it, God will aid him in the world below, and after death he will enable him to gain admittance into paradise, whose vastness is as that of heaven and earth. Therein the maids of glory and holiness will wait upon him in the daytime and in the night season, while the day star of the unfading beauty of his Lord will at all times shed its radiance upon him, and he will shine so brightly that no one shall bear to gaze at him. Such is the dispensation of providence. Yet the people are shut out by a grievous veil. Likewise apprehend thou the nature of hellfire, and be of them that truly believe. For every act performed there shall be a recompense according to the estimate of God. And unto this the very ordinances and prohibitions prescribed by the Almighty amply bear witness. For surely if deeds were not rewarded and yielded no fruit, then the cause of God, exalted as he, would prove futile. Immeasurably high is he exalted above such blasphemies. However, Unto them that are rid of all attachments, a deed is, verily, its own reward. Were we to enlarge upon this theme, numerous tablets would need to be written. So in this passage, as to paradise, it is a reality. And there can be no doubt. And he says, and now in this world, it is love of the manifestation and the good pleasure of God. Say, the love of Christ and his good pleasure, the adoration and homage paid to the Buddha, and the following of his Dharma. And in this sense, it's defined as there is a heaven here, and it is actually following the teachings. And then there is a heaven there, right? As it says, a paradise whose vastness is that of heaven and earth. And that that individual will meet celestial beings, and are shining brilliantly, if you will. But also there is the nature of hellfire, which again is to be cut off, to be separated from, and actually to be, if you will, uh, given the deserts that you yourself have chosen in this life. right? And here it's stated that if this principle of judgment itself was not uh, a reality of the world, then the entire causes of the manifestation would prove completely fruitless. There is no paradise in the estimation of the believers in the divine unity, more exalted than to obey God's commandments. 
and there is no fire in the eyes of those who have known God and his signs, fiercer than to transgress his laws and to oppress another soul, even to the extent of a mustard seed. On the day of resurrection, God will in truth judge all men, and we all verily plead for his grace. So again, is there a paradise more exalted? Is there a fire more fierce? No. To transgress the laws and to oppress another soul. So once again, this concept of oppressing one's own self to transgress the law of God, and then to oppress another individual. The fifth question concerning the bridge of Sirat, paradise, and hell. The prophets of God have come in truth and have spoken the truth. Whatsoever the messenger of God hath announced hath been and will be made manifest. The world is established upon the foundations of reward and punishment. Knowledge and understanding have ever affirmed and will continue to affirm the reality of paradise and hell, for reward and punishment require their existence. Paradise signifieth first and foremost the good pleasure of God. Whosoever attaineth his good pleasure is reckoned and recorded among the inhabitants of the most exalted paradise, and will attain, after the ascension of his soul, that which pen and ink are powerless to describe. For them that are endued with insight, and have fixed their gaze upon the most sublime vision, the bridge, the balance, paradise, hellfire, and all that hath been mentioned and recorded in the sacred scriptures are clear and manifest. At the time of the appearance and manifestation of the rays of the day star of truth, all occupy the same station. God then proclaimeth that which he willeth, and whoso heareth his call and acknowledgeth his truth is accounted among the inhabitants of paradise. Such a soul hath traversed the bridge the balance, and all that hath been recorded regarding the day of resurrection, and hath reached its destination. The day of God's revelation is a day of the most great resurrection. It says here that when we are actually looking at the bridge of Sirat, which is the bridge one, one, ha one has to cross after death, to see whether they end up in heaven and hell in Islam, or the Chinvat bridge, I believe it is, in, in Zoroastrianism, that these, this bridge we have to cross, this paradise and hell, are real. There is reward and punishment, right? And now at the same time, paradise first and foremost, uh, he says, signifieth the good pleasure of God. Nevertheless, what the, the individual experiences after, if you will, living in heaven in this world, is to be passing into this celestial body made up of these elements, that has actually been developed while in this world through the use of our heart, our minds, and uh, all that we have, our will, if you will, in service of the good, then builds that elemental body which has a different conception of space, but has space, has a different conception of time, but still has chronology, if you will. At the time of the appearance of the manifestation of God, Baha'u'llah is telling us that all occupy the same station. They're all given the ability to recognize. Once that happens, those who hear his call recognize in the words and teachings of the manifestation of God the true higher reality of their own self. Answers that call, it says, he is in truth accounted amongst the inhabitants of paradise. Once this occurs, we are in paradise. And it says he has traversed the bridge, the balance, and all that has been recorded regarding the day of resurrection. That this actually is the resurrection of a being when they transfer from, if you will, base copper into gold through the process of recognizing what they truly are. Uh, think again of the twins, you know, standing on Main Street. If this end of these two individuals, one, if you will, being lead and another being gold, one being completely encapsulated and actually bound within his own vices, within his own sensual desires and selfishness, to the degree will he will oppress another soul, 
while he will harm anyone around him to get what he wishes. His other soul, who is a complete utter servant of humankind, and again a servant of the arts and sciences. If this one brother on this side suddenly transformed, recognizing that he himself had a real purpose in life, and it was to carry for an ever-advancing civilization to make the earth one country with mankind its citizens, to actually bring forward the best that he can in his own self and give that light to the world, in some sense he really is not the same person. And that individual has actually been resurrected in the Most Great Resurrection, and has crossed the bridge, narrowly made, and fallen into heaven as opposed to hell. We have to remember that this day of the resurrection, this uh, pa crossing of the Sirat bridge, is to the capacity, this is what it's saying, all occupy the same station, and God proclaims that which he willeth, and whoso heareth his call and acknowledges it. Those who actually have the opportunity to hear it in its early stages, and then answer. <clears throat> we are told uh, over and over within the Baha'i writings that God's mercy exceeds his justice. And that also that the revelations of God are represented such that, um, given that all of our capacities are different, some, as Abdu'l-Bah says, as small as in the cup of a hand, another a full gallon measure. We all have different degrees of discernment, different degrees of intelligence, different degrees of capacity, and we are not actually to berate one for having been created in a, without the same amount of capacity in this world, but rather the revelations of God are actually transmitted to humankind Within, with, with contents within it to answer the hearts and minds of all different natures, both from the philosopher to the most simplest. And we'll start with a quick quote from Shoghi Effendi and another one from Abdu'l-Bah. There is certainly a future life. Heaven and hell are conditions within our own beings. Now punishments and rewards are said to be of two kinds. First, the rewards and punishments of this life. Second, those of the other world. But the paradise and hell of existence are found in all the worlds of God, whether in this world or in the spiritual heavenly worlds. Gaining these rewards is the gaining of eternal life. So in the first quote, uh, which we've seen an aspect of before, that heaven and hell are conditions within our own beings. This is what we've been looking at. What's interesting is, is in the second quote we've heard from Abdu'l-Bah, he says this, the paradise and hell of existence are found where? In all the worlds of God, whether in this world or in the spiritual heavenly worlds. And if we gain the rewards of these heavenly worlds, this is what is mean by uh, sorry. This is what is meant uh, by eternal life. We'll look at this aspect of the many worlds of God very very shortly, but here I want to note: where are heaven and hell found? Are they found only in this world? Only in the next world? No, they are conditions with their own beings, and in every world again found in all the worlds of God. In every single world, there will be a heaven, and there will be a hell. Another aspect of where is heaven, where is hell, we find that they're in each of the worlds of God. But let us read another passage from Abdu'l-Bahá. And the answer to the fourth question, the center of the Son of Truth, is in the supernal world, the kingdom of God. Those souls who are pure and unsullied, upon the dissolution of their elemental frames, hasten the way to the world, world of God. And that world is within this world. The people of this world, however, are unaware of that world, and are even as the mineral and the vegetable that know nothing of the world of the animal and the world of man. Note in this passage, again, Abdu'l-Bahá says, that world speaking of the next world, is within this world. And then he gives an example that people are unaware of that world, even as the mineral and the vegetable know nothing of the world of the animal and the world of man. 
This is a theme that really, really uh, recurs actually in especially the talks of Abdu'l Baha. That we are living in a world right now where I can actually have a stone floor in front of me, and actually a plant on the windowsill, a little puppy dog running around, and I myself, for example, am studying physics. And in this world, each of these have an existence. They all have an access to existence, but there are as barriers of, of awareness. The plant, for example, might note that something got in the way of its sunlight, but couldn't tell if it was a person holding a piece of paper, or it was a cloud far, far up in the sky. There is at least to some degree a sensing, but to think that that degree of sensing itself is like sight, or hearing, or taste, or smell. It is a radically different way of accessing the world. Even the mineral itself, it exists and the plant exists. But the, the mineral itself doesn't grow, doesn't develop, it doesn't recreate copies of itself, give life to the world, fragrance, all these, right? Um, they each have their place. Even when you go to the animal, a dog, for example, is running around my house right now, that dog might know me, be able to interact with me for to certain degrees, but if I'm standing there doing physics, for example, it has no access to the realm of abstract thought, of scientific endeavor, of the creation of the arts. There is such a radical difference between me and this animal, but there's a radical difference between that animal and that plant, or that plant and the tile, stone tile of my kitchen floor. And in such a case, we all occupy the same world. And we're told by Abdu'l Paul quite often, actually, in his writings and his, in his talks, that the world that we call the heavenly worlds is not a separate place. They're stacked on top of each other, just like mineral, animal, plant, and human. One of the questions that I think arises here is that it says that the paradise and hell that is found in all the worlds of God, whether in this world or the, or the spiritual world, gaining the rewards of these, the paradise in each of those worlds, is what is meant by eternal life. So this is what I we want to turn to. All the keys of heaven God has chosen to place on my right hand, and all the keys of hell on my left. I am the primal point from which have been generated all created things. I am the countenance of God, whose splendor can never be obscured, the light of God, whose radiance can never fade. Whoso recognizeth me, assurance and all good are in store for him. And whoso faileth to recognize me, infernal fire and all evil await him. By the righteousness of him who is the absolute truth, were the veil to be lifted, thou wouldst witness on this earthly plain all men sorely afflicted with the fire of the wrath of God, a fire fiercer and greater than the fire of hell, with the exception of those who have sought shelter beneath the shade of the tree of my love. For they, in very truth, are the blissful. So in this passage, I just get, I broke it up a little bit for context. The Bob is saying he is the primal point, from which, through which have been generated all created things, the heavenly manifestation of God, reflected in the person of the Bob on this world, in this world. But then he says, he gives the example of um, infernal fire and paradise, and then states, and were the veil to be lifted, you would witness what? All men sorely afflicted with the fire of the wrath of God, a fire fiercer and greater than the fire of hell. Once again, this is in this world. He's saying in recognition of him, if he were to lift the veil for you, you would witness the people of the world currently in the fires of hell. These people, it's being stated, are in a state of hell and are completely unaware that they are. They don't know. And I want to hold on to this theme for a while. Since that day is a great day, 
it would be sorely trying for thee to identify thyself with the believers. For the believers of that day are the inmates of paradise, while the unbelievers are the inmates of the fire. And know thou of a certainty that by paradise is meant recognition of and submission unto him whom God shall make manifest, and by the fire the company of such souls as would fail to submit unto him, or to be resigned to his good pleasure. On that day thou wouldst regard thyself as the inmate of paradise, and as a true believer in him, whereas in reality thou wouldst suffer thyself to be wrapped in veils, and thy habitation would be the nethermost fire, though thou thyself wouldst not be cognizant thereof. This is a pivotal quote for me, actually, completely pivotal. Uh, the reason why is because he gives us our example that the believers in that day are in paradise, while the unbelievers are the inmates of the fire. It's not that they will, again, be the inmates of the fire. They are the inmates of the fire. They've been cut, up, uh, cut, a, cut off from the very purpose of their existence. But then he says, um, by paradise is meant what? The recognition of the message of God and turning unto it and submitting unto it, turning your mirror unto the sun. And then he says, and by the fire, the company of such souls as would fail to submit unto him or be resigned to his good pleasure. So what is the fire being allowed to be in the state of being careless, of not caring of others, and of being able to be surrounded by people that are like you? I often think of, for example, I say a very extreme example would be like, you know, like a Cuban drug lord, right? Or a Colombian drug lord who on the outside has these amazing power boats, yachts, beautiful mansions. Around him are all these beautiful women. He's all happy. He has everything that the sensuality of himself would desire. He can have the most expensive alcohols. You know what I mean? The most expensive cigars. And his whim are, if you will, chemicals that he can adjust at any moment to pseudo uplift his heart and mind. For many people, they see this and they would actually think like, wow, that man has the life. And such individuals will gravitate towards him. You know in such a picture, like a Scarface, a Tony Mantana from Scarface, you have him surrounded by others like him. And they all look to him and they want what he has, the power of life and death over people, the ability to buy off judges, police, and politicians, and what many people still today think of as living the life. And yet he's in hell, surrounded by fire. The hell is the state and condition of his own being. And what are the flames of the fire? Actually, the people that look up to him. The people that want what he wants and will actually turn to him in longing and he can see their longing faces looking up at him that they want to be him. They respect, if you will, a pseudo respect, a pseudo admiration, a pseudo attraction from a pseudo prophet who is actually himself the object of envy and he sees admiration. Object of lust and he sees love He confuses them. This is actually what I think is being communicated to us by the Bob in passages like this and by Baha'u'llah It's that this individual Says on that day thou wouldst regard thyself as the inmate of paradise and a true believer and yet in reality thou would suffer thyself to be wrapped in the veils and the habitation would be the nethermost fire and Thyself would not be cognizant thereof. And this is really the important, like, if you will, cardinal point of this section. You can be in hell and have no idea that you are. And in a sense, when one is actually turning away from the manifestation of God, turning away from the teachings that are to actually resound with his heart and mind, with the very purpose or teleology of human existence, when a person is not in sync with this, 
that they can think that everything in their life is wonderful. Be in the fire and not cognizant thereof. Another theme that is going to come up again over and over in subsequent sections of this deepening is actually the lure of happiness. And we're going to see that actually what we often mean by our pursuit of happiness can actually be the flames of fire that we're supposed to be avoiding. And likewise he saith, Recognize him by his verses. The greater your neglect in seeking to know him, the more grievously will ye be veiled in fire. The reason why I chose this passage explicitly is because it actually says the greater your neglect in seeking to know him. There are many souls in the history of religion, in the history of our world, who never would have had the chance to hear this, the message of the Prophet Muhammad, or the Buddha, or Jesus Christ, or Baha'u'llah, or the Bab. The question is, is, is an individual in such a, in such a situation seeking? But even those who actually encounter what is being asked is, will this individual put forward effort to find the purpose and goal of human existence? Or is this a something that is seen automatically as something to be brushed off? Or something to be ignored when, if you will, the itch comes? <laughs> you know what I mean? When you suddenly are wondering, well, what if? What if there is some greater purpose? It's actually that the more you neglect to seek, the more grievous you will be veiled in fire. And, and again, I would stress, what is that fire, right? That fire is baser desires, carnal lusts, being actually, um, if you will, almost like covered in the dust or dross, right? That obscures the true nature of what we're at, or sort of what we should be. But at the same time, we generally associate with those like unto us. So the flames of the fire are generally those who agree with us in our worldly pursuits when a world out there suffers and longs for deliverance from its suffering, when there are the fruits of compassion and love and justice and mercy, of understanding the universe, of education and intellectual enlightenment and the arts in service of the beauty of humankind. Know thou that thou wilt succeed in doing so, if thou believest with undoubting faith. However, since thou canst not attain the state of undoubting faith, due to the intervening veils of thy selfish desires, therefore thou wilt tarry in the fire, though realizing it not. What does the Bob say in this passage? Thou wilt tarry in the fire, though realizing it not. We can be in hell and have no idea we're in it. Uh, the following is a quote from Promulgation of Universal Peace by Abdu'l-Baha. In the matrix of the mother, the unborn child was deprived and unconscious of the world of material existence. But after its birth, it beheld the wonders and beauties of a new realm of life and being. In the world of the matrix, it was utterly ignorant and una unable to conceive of these new conditions. But after its transformation, it discovers the radiant sun, trees, flowers, and an infinite range of blessings and bounties awaiting it. In the human plane and kingdom, man is a captive of nature and ignorant of the divine world until born of the breasts of the Holy Spirit, out of physical conditions of limitation and deprivation. Then he beholds the reality of the spiritual realm and kingdom, realizes the narrow restrictions of the mere human world of existence, and becomes conscious of the unlimited and infinite glories of the world of God. Therefore, no matter how man may advance upon the physical and intellectual plane, he is ever in need of the boundless virtues of divinity, the protection of the Holy Spirit, and the face of God. So in this quote, it says that uh, man is a captive of nature and ignorant of the divine world. 
until born of the breath of the Holy Spirit, a recognition of one's true station beyond the confines of this simple world, the limitation and deprivation, and that we realize the narrow restrictions of the mere human world of existence and become conscious of the unlimited and infinite glories of the world of God. So in a sense, it's the ability for the embryo in the womb of the mother to realize that the body that it has, you know, if you will, like jammed up inside the womb, uh, which is actually even causing it discomfort, is itself limbs for that world beyond. So if you imagine if you actually were a fetus and um, you were in the womb of the mother and you wanted perfect comfort, you actually wanted perfect comfort, perfect joy in that world, what would you want? Not arms, not legs, or fingers and toes. You'd probably just want to be a round ball with a very large umbilical cord. <laughs> you'd want to be able to draw as much as you possibly could from the mother and not have these cramped legs and arms which in that world actually have no function whatsoever. However, in, if you were purely, if you were dedicating your life towards what is comfortable and pleasure and makes you happy in that world, when you were birthed into the next one, well, you would be a basketball. And have nothing that you could possibly do, right? Whereas recognizing, if you will, the unlimited and infinite glories of the will of God, that these actual, these intellectual capacities, spiritual capacities, philanthropic deeds, self-sacrifice, knowledge of God, the love of God, are the way you build that elemental body that enables you to have time without time, place without place, and move through the worlds of God. If you were to realize that, then all of a sudden that which is uncomfortable in the womb, like the growing of appendages and even of eyesight, eyes and ears and nose and tongue, which you're not even taking food through, uh, all of a sudden make sense. Suddenly they make sense because you understand the nature of the condition within you live. Then you will actually focus your energies and you would want stronger arms, stronger legs, better forms because you realize you're about to move into a world. Another analogy I often think of is imagine you're the, you know, the person that greets people as they come into an establishment. And you see this gentleman walk in and he goes off. And about, say, 30, 40 minutes later, the man walks up and begins to complain. And he says, you know, this is, this is the worst restaurant I've ever been in. Uh, the, the seats are hard. You know, the, the place is dingy, it kind of stinks, uh, the food is just garbage, it's just like, you know, basically fast food out of a, of a vending machine. And he begins to complain everything from the, the feel of it, the seats, the lighting, and he says to you, like, this is just absolutely the worst restaurant I've ever been in, in my life. And then you collect yourself for a moment and you say, well, sure, that's because this is a gym. You're in a workout room. The point being here is that if this individual walks into a gym, a place where they're supposed to develop capacities, strengthen their body, right? Uh, or if they were to walk into a dojo thinking it's a spa, it, it, the way we actually approach that world is going to be completely and radically different. In the Baha'i writings, we're told explicitly that we're supposed to be developing or working out or learning our dojo skills, learning a martial art, and we should not get seduced by the fact, or if you will, sorry, the misunderstanding that we are in a spa or a restaurant. It's important that we can actually be in a gym and in a dojo the entire time thinking we're in a restaurant or in a spa, no matter what the maitre d' at the door says. No, moreover, that should one who hath attained unto these stations, and embarked upon these journeys, fall prey to pride and vainglory, he would at that very moment come to naught, and return to the first step without realizing it. Uh, here in the Gems of Divine Mysteries, Baha'u'llah adds another very frightening <laughs> uh, point is that we ourselves, 
and he's actually talking about parts of the Gems of Divine Mysteries are, are like the Seven Valleys, if you're familiar with the work, about the journey of the soul from the abode of dust into the celestial home, about our journey towards God and the purification of our own beings. And in this, he says that in moving through these, if we fall prey to pride or vainglory, we can actually return to the very beginning of our journey, hell, and not realize it. Our next section, do non-Baha'is go to heaven? So our first quote um, is from Abdu'l-Baha in the Propagation of our Universal Peace. But when I consider this calamity in another respect, I am consoled by the realization that the worlds of God are infinite. That though they were deprived of this existence, they have other opportunities in the life beyond. Even as Christ has said, in my Father's house are many mansions. They were called away from the temporary and transferred to the eternal. They abandoned this material existence and entered the portals of the spiritual world. Forgoing the pleasures and comforts of the earthly, they now partake of a joy and happiness far more abiding and real, for they have hastened to the kingdom of God. The mercy of God is infinite, and it is our duty to remember these departed souls in our prayers and supplications, that they may draw nearer and nearer to the source itself. This analogy expresses the relation of the temporal world to the life hereafter. The transition of the soul of man from darkness and uncertainty to the light and reality of the eternal kingdom. At first it is very difficult to welcome death, but after attaining its new condition the soul is grateful, for it has been released from the bondage of the limited to enjoy the liberties of the unlimited. It has been freed from a world of sorrow, grief, and trials, to live in a world of unending bliss and joy. The phenomenal and physical have been abandoned in order that it may attain the opportunities of the ideal and spiritual. Therefore, the souls of those who have passed away from earth and completed their span of mortal pilgrimage in the titanic disaster have hastened to a world superior to this. They have soared away from these conditions of darkness and dim vision into the realm of light. These are the only considerations which can comfort and console those whom they have left behind. In the quote, we're told, one, the worlds of God are infinite. That individuals who are deprived in this existence have other opportunities in the life beyond. And that the mercy of God is infinite. And that a soul, this is actually about the Titanic, as we see, the, uh, the singing of the Titanic, that the soul has been freed from a world of sorrow, grief, and trials to live in another world of bliss and joy. Now, I would propose uh, for Baha'i and non-Baha'i friends who might be listening, it is impossible that the Master here is claiming that every individual on the Titanic in this grievous disaster was a believer. It's impossible. It is impossible that, first of all, that he's claiming that they're all Baha'is. That is utterly impossible. Or that they're all Christians, or Christians, Muslims, and Buddhists, uh, that they were all believers. But he's saying that these individuals have moved from a realm of confinement and constriction, and to understand that such souls have actually been released from the cage of this body. Because God's grace is infinite. Now they weren't allowed, able to make, uh, if you will, a perfect life, but they will have opportunities in their life beyond. What those opportunities are, we shall soon see. The challenge here is because it sounds as if these individuals, some of whom we have to assume, have not recognized the manifestation of God, are not necessarily fulfilling their, if you will, their the purpose of their existence. Uh, given the, the definitions of heaven and hell, how could this be? But oftentimes heaven is used, I would propose, in reference to the next world. The world after this, the afterlife, the great beyond. 
The other times it's often used, and oftentimes the term paradise is used in such cases, that is actually expressing the state or condition within our being. In a sense, we all go to parrot, we all go to heaven, but we don't all go to paradise. So can we make up for lost opportunities? I think we've already seen one instance where we're told that. Uh, this is from Shoghi Effendi. He feels that many of the perplexities that arise in your mind could be dissipated if you always conceived of the teachings as one great whole with many facets. Truth may, in covering different subjects, appear to be contradictory, and yet it is all one if you carry the thought through to the end. For instance, the statement on life after death and the condition of believers and non-believers you might say that a wonderful believer is like a diamond blazing in the sun, an unawakened soul like one in a dark room. But we must couple this concept with the other part of the teachings, that God's mercy exceeds his justice, and that soul can progress in the world beyond. The unillumined soul can become brilliant. There is a principle here in this passage that actually is, I almost think, universally relevant in our study of the Baha'i Faith as well as our study of the Baha'i Faith and its relationship, say, to Buddhism or Christianity or Islam or Judaism. Because he says, truth may, in covering different subjects, appear to be contradictory. And yet it is all one if you carry the thought through to the end. It doesn't mean, you know, truth can appear to be contradictory, so don't worry about it. <laughs> it's actually saying, then we should be carrying this through to the end and really, like really exploring it. And he then gives this example of the afterlife. Um, and he says that a wonderful believer is like a diamond, the one brother on the street, uh, like a blazing in the sun, an un unawakened soul is like one in a dark room. Um, they're both diamonds. One blazing like the sun, one in a dark room, a mirror facing the sun or in the same position and flipping and reflecting nothing. Um, they both have the same capacity. And then he says that the soul can progress in the world. The unillumined soul can become brilliant. Okay, Unillumined soul can become brilliant. And there are many divergent realities and concepts related to the great beyond, generally. And Really, we have to be, if you will, take these differing positions that we find within our own writings and others and try to carry them through to create a picture. That's why at the beginning I called this a conversation starter. And at this point, we know that there is a heaven, there is a hell, there is a judgment. And at the same time, it seems that those who have not become illumined can do in the next world. It is even possible that the conditions of those who have died in sin and unbelief may become changed. That is to say, they may become the object of pardon through the bounty of God, not through his justice. For bounty is giving without desert, and justice is giving what is deserved. As we have power to pray for these souls here, so likewise we shall possess the same power in the other world, which is the kingdom of God. Are not all the people in that world the creatures of God? Therefore in that world also they can make progress. As here they can receive light by their supplication, there also they can plead for forgiveness and receive light through entreaties and supplications. Thus as souls in this world through the help of the supplications, the entreaties, and the prayers of the Holy Ones, can acquire development, so it is the same after death. Through their own prayers and supplications, they can also progress, more especially when they are the object of the intercession of the Holy Manifestations. So once again we see that he says that those who have died in sin and unbelief may become changed. That in that world they can also make progress. Both quotes from the actual text. They can actually do so by to plead for forgiveness, receive light through their supplications, and that souls in the help in this world, uh, through the help of such entreaties and prayers, can develop so is it the same after death. So that 
in, in essence, individuals who have missed the ability to find the beloved and to begin to shine like a diamond, uh, having been left in a darkened room, have the ability, the possibility, to actually progress in the next world. This first quote is from Shoghi Effendi. In accepting Baha'u'llah, you have accepted Christ in his appearance as the Father, as he himself so clearly foretold. The Catholic Church does not believe this. On the contrary, it still awaits the return of Christ. If you decide, in order to be buried next to your dear husband, to return to the Church, you either would have to, in good faith, deny Baha'u'llah, or you would be just using the Church as a means to satisfy desire of your own, which would certainly not be an upright and conscientious thing to do. When you think that your husband's soul is now free of the limitations of this world, and that he no doubt is beginning to see religious truth in its true light, and to appreciate the station of Baha'u'llah, you should ask yourself whether he would wish you to leave the truth for this day, and re-enter the church just for the sake of your dust being near his dust. Your spirit, when you pass away, will be near his spirit. Of what importance, then, is the body? He will pray for your guidance in this matter. In this passage, the context is that a Baha'i, who was formerly a Catholic, is asking the guardian if it was okay for her to actually um, be buried in the sacraments of the Catholic Church, because they would not allow her to be buried there. And he says that Quote, and that he no doubt is beginning to see religious truth in its true light and to appreciate the station of Baha'u'llah. That's the, the, the heart of the quote I want to look at. Because this individual himself, because um, he's telling, the, the guardian is telling this woman that she cannot in good faith proclaim certain beliefs that she doesn't actually believe, to follow certain rites that she shouldn't be following if she herself is not a genuine Catholic, that this is, would be ingenuine. And in this context here, he's saying to her, well, your, your husband is, fully, is beginning to see, again, uh, religious truth in its true light, and to appreciate the station of Baha'u'llah. Beginning to. Uh, and is beginning to see religious truth and appreciate the station of Baha'u'llah, which means, in that world, he does not know. When he entered this world, the unveiling of religious truth begins, which includes the station of Baha'u'llah, but it does not mean, or it means that the husband does not immediately know. Often we have a conception within uh, religious communities that it's like, well, if I have a friend of mine, and you know, say I'm a Christian, and this individual is not, that, well, when he dies, he'll know I was right. Uh, I've heard this said uh, in the context of Baha'i <laughs> discussions as well, uh, and Muslim uh, discussions as well. But According to the writings, this individual is coming to appreciate the station of Baha'u'llah, meaning he did not know. In essence, he did not know that Baha'u'llah was a manifestation of God. This next passage is actually passages within passage, uh, because the, uh, they'll be quoting uh, the Guardian, for example, or Abdu'l Baha, but the letter itself is from the Universal House of Justice in response to a believer. We'll begin. With reference to Baha'u'llah's tablet in which he says that all the relatives of believers will reach the kingdom in the other world, by this is meant only a partial attainment. They can, however, progress indefinitely, as spiritual progress in the other world is limitless and is not confined to those who have attained unto the knowledge and recognition of the cause while still in this world. For example, the following extract from a letter dated March 17, 1940, written on behalf of the Guardian to a believer whose father had recently passed away, provides the following statement. The Guardian wishes me to hasten to convey to you the expression of his deepest sympathy in this grievous loss which you have come to sustain. 
He will specially and earnestly pray for his departed soul, that in the realms of the spirit beyond it may receive such guidance as would enable it to fully recognize and accept the faith, and thereby attain abiding peace and happiness. Shoghi Effendi, in a letter dated May 22, 1935, written on his behalf to an individual believer, makes the following statement. Concerning your question whether a soul can receive knowledge of the truth in the world beyond, such a knowledge is surely possible, and it is a sign of the loving mercy of the Almighty. We can, through our prayers, help every soul to gradually attain this high station even if it has failed to reach it in this world. The progress of the soul does not come to an end with death. It rather starts along a new line. It is possible for a soul not only to recognize the truth in the next world, but also to make up for lost opportunities. Shoghi Effendi, in the following letters written on his behalf to individual believers, states, no man can obtain everlasting life, in the full sense of the term, except through acknowledging the manifestation of God in this age, Baha'u'llah. If he doesn't do it in this world, he will have a chance to progress in the next one. He will pray that the Beloved may sustain and comfort you in your great sorrow, and that also he may, in his unfailing and all-merciful love, Bless the soul of your departed husband and enable it to grow and advance spiritually and attain unto the full recognition of his revelation. Now that the veil has been lifted and that his soul has been liberated from the material limitations of this contingent world, may he be guided to a truer and deeper appreciation of this cause and make up for his lost opportunities while he was still in this world. The quote is actually, it starts with the quote from Shoghi Effendi, and it, where he says that the relatives achieve a partial attainment, but that the progress in the spiritual world is limitless and is not confined to those who have attained under the knowledge and recognition of the cause while still in this world. So an individual who has not recognized the cause, not known of it in this world, may have an opportunity to do so in the future. The second quote again, on behalf of the Guardian, he says that in the realms of the spirit beyond it may receive such guidance as would enable it to fully recognize and accept the faith. We know that such a knowledge is possible, they actually quote him as saying, even if it has failed to reach it in this world. The progress of the soul does not come to an end in death, all quotes. It is possible for a soul not only to recognize the truth in the next world, but also to make up for lost opportunities. Again, quoting, he will have a chance to progress in the next one. Or, it will enable it to go and advance spiritually and attain under the full recognition of his revelation. May he be guided to a truer and deeper appreciation of this cause, appreciation of this cause, and make up for lost opportunities while he was still in this world. It's a very beautiful picture uh, for these individuals having the ability to actually make up for lost opportunities, to recognize the cause, to recognize the manifestation. But all of this is predicated on the fact that they have not. They don't know. These individuals, in each of the cases, if you go through it, are individuals that have passed on. They have gone to the great beyond. And they themselves, in the great beyond, do not know this cause was true. They do not know the manifestation of God was Baha'u'llah. These individuals, it says, it is may receive such guidance. Such knowledge is surely possible. It is possible for a soul to recognize truth in the next world. Possible for them to make up for lost opportunities. We'll have a chance to progress. If you listen to the quotes I already quoted, in each case, um, it's that you can have a full, you can come to a full recognition of the revelation, and oh, may he be guided. May he be guided to a truer and deeper appreciation of the cause, and if so, make up for lost opportunities. So the idea that a beloved one who does not agree with you, um, uh, that when they pass on, they in that reckoning, 
if you remember all the way from the beginning, in that judgment, they suddenly will somehow see that they're wrong, and that the errors they have made in the life, in this life, but at the same time, don't actually know that they rejected a true manifestation of God. They do not know that, that the revelation of God is the revelation of God. This idea that individuals do not know the manifestation of God for their time period, uh, once they enter the next world, if we really think about the definitions and what we know of heaven and hell, should actually be obvious once we begin to consider it. Um, we live in a state of hell or a state of heaven. Those being defined repeatedly as first, if you know the opening of the Most Holy Book, <laughs> the recognition of the manifestation of God, and then following His commandments and His good pleasure. Carrying out the if you will, the physician's remedy for this world, being a part of reconstructing society in the vision of the manifestation of God for that day. So if I am in this world, and I am in heaven, or paradise, to make it clear, where do I go? Paradise, when I pass on. Because I move from a state of knowing the manifestation of God in this period into a state of knowing the manifestation of God in this day. Well, of course, then, the, the individual who is actually in hell in this world, thereby defined as reunion, as, if you will, sorry, the lack of reunion with the manifestation of God, the lack of the knowledge of the very purpose, the teleology, the telos of that individual, and not acting, right? Again, the second condition, the opening of the Most Holy Book, and not fulfilling that which is for the best and greatest good of humankind in this day moves from that position of hell, a lack of knowledge, and working with that knowledge to embody his teachings, to a place in the next world of a lack of knowledge and not embodying his teachings. <laughs> we move from paradise to paradise, from fire to fire. We don't move from paradise to fire, or from fire to paradise. So if we suddenly knew what the God's cause was in the next world, and appreciated the station of Baha'u'llah, as he tells this uh, um, uh, formerly Catholic wife that he doesn't, um, then we would actually move from a lack of knowledge and a lack of embodiment and following his teachings, and at our death would immediately know that that individual was a manifestation of God, and thus would enter paradise. But that's not what we're told. It's, he it's hell to hell, paradise to paradise. Um, the following two quick quotes are uh, written on behalf of the Guardian. November 15th, 1940 Dear Mr. Vakil, Your letter of the second instant has just reached our beloved Guardian, and he indeed feels most profoundly grieved of the news of the passing away of your elder brother in Nasvari on the 14th of October last. He wishes me to hasten in conveying to you and relatives heartfelt condolences on this truly heavy loss you have so cruelly sustained, and specially to assure you of his special prayers on behalf of the deceased, that in the realms beyond he may be guided to the recognition and acceptance of the cause, and thereby progress and advance spiritually. May the Beloved deal mercifully with his soul, and enable it to attain to highest spiritual destiny. And may he also protect his bereaved family, and impart abiding solace to their sorrow-laden hearts." So at the end of the section we see that once again, that in the realms beyond he may be guided to a recognition and acceptance of the cause, and thereby progress and advance spiritually. And the second quote, that in the realms beyond, she may have the joy of recognizing Baha'u'llah. In each of these cases, the guardian is dictating his wishes that he will say prayers that the past, the loved ones who have passed on, the loved ones of these Baha'is, may have the opportunity to be guided to the recognition of this cause. 
and understand the station of Baha'u'llah, a theme we will uh, delve into more shortly. There's the next section I call the Endless Worlds of God. The simple question is, how many are there? This first quote comes from Baha'u'llah. You may be sure his ardent prayers will be offered for the success of your Baha'i work, and he will also pray for your father and for the soul of your dear mother, that in this world beyond she may have the joy of recognizing Baha'u'llah. Um, so this very quick quote states what? That the creation of God embraces worlds besides this world and creatures apart from his creatures. Um, and there are things ordained in some of these worlds that we could never even contemplate. And I think this, well, my son may take this to mean worlds in our, say, example, our multiverse or extended universe. Uh, there are things that cannot be contemplated, and we will see in the next quote, that we're discussing spiritual worlds. Verily I say, the creation of God embraces worlds besides this world, and creatures apart from these creatures. In each of these worlds he hath ordained things which none can search except himself, the all-searching, the all-wise. So here he says there are worlds holy and spiritually glorious that will be unveiled to our eyes. And, it's, and in here he talks about his sustaining grace. He says, and to obtain a portion of their sustaining grace, to get the benefits of these worlds, their joys and their sustaining grace. And the question is, and we'll return to it, what is the sustaining grace in those other worlds of God, really endless worlds of God, that we're supposed to actually derive? O oh, my servants, sorrow not if in these days and on this earthly plane, things contrary to your wishes have been ordained and manifested by God. For days of blissful joy, of heavenly delight, are assuredly in store for you. Worlds, holy and spiritually glorious, will be unveiled to your eyes. You are destined by him, in this world and hereafter, to partake of their benefits, to share in their joys, and to obtain a portion of their sustaining grace. To each and every one of them you will, no doubt, attain. So the worlds are countless in number and infinite in range. So according to Baha'u'llah, the cosmos is countless vertically, countless worlds, and each infinite within its range, or infinite basically horizontally and vertically. And yet, Abdu'l Baha says the following. As to thy question concerning the worlds of God, know thou of a truth that the worlds of God are countless in their number and infinite in their range. None can reckon or comprehend them except God, the all knowing, the all wise. Uh, in this passage, he actually said at the same time, says there is one world. But this is actually, if we actually look, it says that the creation of God, the first quote we looked at, the creation of God embraceth worlds besides this world. So in one sense, there is one world, one creation, with infinite worlds, or countless worlds, infinite in range, within them. And we've looked at this theme previously um, as to where are heaven and hell, but also where are the worlds of God. Um, the following quote is from Abdu Baha. O thou seeker after truth, the world of the kingdom is one world. The only difference is that spring returneth over and over again, and setteth up a great new commotion throughout all created things. So once more we see this theme of uh, stacked kingdoms within the world we inhabit as a representation, an analogy for an understanding of the many worlds of God. Here we have the example once again of the mineral, a stone, and on top of a stone is growing some moss, or you know what I mean, and a little plant, and on that plant is an insect, and a frog is eating that insect, right? And a cat's chasing the frog. We actually have all these different, if you will, cascading even degrees within kingdoms, 
right? The moss and the flower, the insect, the frog, and the cat. And we see that they're all interacting, and I myself could be a biologist studying the feeding habits of this frog. All of these worlds and kingdoms, if you will, can actually coexist at once. And he gives them examples of kingdoms. He gives the, he actually speaks of them as worlds. States of being and states of relative existence that we can occupy. But that in each of these, the ability to truly discern fully the reality of the kingdom above us is cut off. There's a block. We're unable to do so. I remember seeing once, it was a, it was a picture of uh, actually a marine biologist, right? Uh, literally bending down to actually touch a whale. And there was a fish in the background, jumping, and on the back of the whale there was like a barnacle. And it was fascinating to me because I could see in this one picture all these different kingdoms actually uh, interacting at once. All existing. Many of them living, but how different the nature of the livingness, if you will, or the state of being that they are occupying. Know ye that the world of existence is a single world, although its stations are various and distinct. For example, the mineral life occupies its own plane, but a mineral entity is without any awareness at all of the vegetable kingdom, and indeed, with its inner tongue, denieth that there is any such kingdom. In the same way, a vegetable entity knoweth nothing of the animal world, remaining completely heedless and ignorant thereof. For the stage of the animal is higher than that of the vegetable, and the vegetable is veiled from the animal world, and inwardly denieth the existence of that world. All this while animal, vegetable, and mineral dwell together in the one world. In the same way the animal remaineth totally unaware of that power of the human mind, which graspeth universal ideas, and layest bare the secrets of creation. So that a man who liveth in the East can make plans and arrangements for the West, can unravel mysteries, although located on the continent of Europe, can discover America, although sighted on the earth, can lay hold of the inner realities of the stars of heaven. Of this power of discovery which belongeth to the human mind, this power which can grasp abstract and universal ideas, the animal remaineth totally ignorant, and indeed denieth its existence. In the same way, the denizens of this earth are completely unaware of the world of the kingdom, and deny the existence thereof. They ask, for example, where is the kingdom? Where is the lord of the kingdom? These people are even as the mineral, and the vegetable, who know nothing whatever of the animal and the human realm. They see it not, they find it not. Yet the mineral and vegetable, the animal and man, are all living here together in this world of existence. I think what's so beautiful about this quote is it gives us insight into where the worlds of God are, and how they relate to the world in which we live. Because here it's talking about the animal, the vegetable, uh, and the mineral and their existence in relationship to ours, and how each of these levels is actually present in the same space, if you will, and in the same realm, yet at the same time, because of the barriers uh, to access, um, we are unaware of them. So you have the mineral in the same domain as you have the vegetable, and the animal, and the human, and the spiritual worlds beyond these. So for example, if I'm standing in my living room, and in my living room is a plant, there is a chair, there is my dog, <laughs> and myself. They all exist, coexist really, in the same domain, and yet the chair, say it's made out of wood or it's made out of metal, has no access or no awareness of the fact that there is a plant sitting on top of it. And that plant has no access or awareness, for example, that there is a dog running around. And I myself can be aware of all of these. The animal, the dog, is not cognizant of the fact 
that there is a conversation going on between myself, for example, and my wife, which is, say, about physics, or history, or sociology, or philosophy. Um, the only things he has access to is potentially when I say the word walk, or treat. These are the only things that that animal is capable of being aware of. Now that animal might be aware of the plant, and that there's a chair. Yet, the real, real, if you will, recognition of all the different grades of being, would only be within my mind. And I think when we read these passages within the Baha'i Writings, we see that the worlds beyond what we might, for example, term the supernatural worlds, are not supernatural in the sense that they are somewhere else, or supernatural in the sense that they are something else in the way that completely separate, but rather it is simply that they are of a grade above us, like we are above the animal, or the animal is above the vegetable, or the plant kingdom. They're all coexisting at once. And what we mean by supernatural, as we see in passages from Abdu'l-Baha, is that the plant is supernatural to the mineral. The animal is supernatural to the plant. We are supernatural to that animal, and the worlds beyond are supernatural to us. It is not that there is a completely different realm of existence, it's simply that we are looking at all these different kingdoms and accessing them in different ways. As Abdu'l-Baha says, Yet the mineral and vegetable, the animal and man, are all living here together in this world of existence. I remember seeing a picture once years and years ago, and I used it in a presentation, where there's actually a marine biologist, a woman bending down in front of an orca. And as she's bending down, you can actually see a fish um, jumping in the background. And at the same time, you could imagine there being like a barnacle upon that whale. All of these realms are present. There is the water, there is the dock that she's standing on. There is this living creature in a sense, the barnacle on, on the whale. There is a fish, and there is this orca, and a human. All of them are coexisting at once within that domain, yet their ability to understand and access each of them is radically different. She understands the ecology of this, of the whale, and of the barnacle, and of the fish, and of what's going on underneath the water. This whale, this great being, actually has some access to a relationship between her and him or her. <laughs> and then the same thing goes the fish in the background might have no awareness whatsoever of what's going on around it, but is obviously more aware than the water. Each of these domains being supernatural to the other. So when we look at and reflect on upon the worlds of existence, we have to try our best to remember and really, really, if you will, take this to heart and understand that the kingdoms, if you will, um, are all in one place. They are all existing at one time, and yet are unaware of each other. This quote also makes me think of multiple discussions I've had in the past where I've been talking to a friend or to a seeker, and they've said, well, it's just difficult because you believe in the supernatural. And to make a point, in the past I have said, but I don't. And they'll re respond, <laughs> Well, of course you do. You believe in you know, uh, realms beyond, you believe in God, and you believe in manifestations of God, if you will, the prophets. And I would say, but I don't believe in the supernatural. These are all natural phenomenon. They are all part of the world. Uh, to make sense of this, <laughs> in the past I've said, for example, uh, most people will consider, say, ghosts as supernatural. Yet if they were real, and if we suddenly discerned that they actually are a real phenomenon, something that can then be uh, understood, documented, and explored, then suddenly we would actually recognize that ghosts, if they were real, would be a natural phenomenon of our world, and we would begin to reflect upon them. At that very moment it would transform from that which is supernatural to that which is natural, but the only thing that has changed is our understanding or our interpretation of the world in which we live. So when it comes, for example, to the existence of worlds beyond, and 
even of messengers of God, if I understand them to be part of the natural order of reality, to be just what is, then they become natural. The questioner remarked that many differing opinions were held as to the conditions of the future life. Some thought that all would have exactly the same perfections and virtues, that all would be alike and equal. Abdu'l-Bahá said there would be variety and differing degrees of attainment as in this world. In this quote, we are told that there would be variety or differing degrees of attainment as in this world. So in this world we see different degrees of attainment and different kingdoms and different structures and levels, and that is the same in the next world. The following quote is from the Bab. No created thing shall ever attain its paradise, unless it appeareth in its highest prescribed degree of perfection. For instance, this crystal representeth the paradise of the stone, whereof it, its substance is composed. Likewise there are various stages in the paradise for the crystal itself. So long as it was stone it was worthless, but if it attaineth the excellence of ruby, a potentiality which is latent in it, how much a carat will it be worth? Consider likewise every created thing. In this quote we are told that the paradise of a thing, <laughs> of a station, is to actually acquire the highest degree of perfection prescribed there. So while we are, say for example, through our actions, through our knowledge, through our conduct, and through our seeking, our attain us, we attain a certain station in the next world, there is perfections within that station that we are actually placed within, and that our paradise is within that station to achieve the highest degree of perfection we can. This next quote is from Baha'u'llah. The people of Baha, who are the inmates of the Ark of God, are, one and all, well aware of one another's state and condition, and are united in the bonds of intimacy and fellowship. Such a state, however, must depend upon their faith and their conduct. They that are of the same grade and station are fully aware of one another's capacity, character, accomplishments, and merits. They that are of a lower grade, however, are incapable of comprehending adequately the station or of estimating the merits of those that rank above them. So in this quote we are told that those who are of the same grade, those who are of the same level, can actually estimate the worth of the individual that they are addressing or interacting with within the next world, yet that those who are of a lower nature are incapable of doing so. And this should actually make a lot of sense, because when we think about it, if I am sitting in front of a world-class violinist, I actually know that this individual is, say, profoundly skilled. But unless I myself am a violinist, I will not be able to truly estimate the merit of this world-class violinist. And if we start to scale up this idea, we realize that we can't truly estimate the worth or value of a world-class violinist unless we are that world-class violinist. The same goes in the domain of knowledge. If I am sitting in front of Albert Einstein as a fledgling physicist or as a lay physicist, if I'm trying to understand Einstein, I can't truly estimate the brilliance of an Einstein. I might know that there's something strange about him. I might know that he's quite an intelligent individual. But to really truly grasp, if you will, the station of a Nobel Prize laureate in physics, I actually have to be one of those individuals. And the same is in the next world. So if I am of a lower grade or a lower station within the next world, I can, I believe personally that I can actually see that there is something strange about this character, yet there is a block for my ability to truly estimate their merits, truly estimate their worth. And as we'll see, this makes more sense as we move along. I swear by him who hath caused me to reveal whatever hath pleased him. Ye are better known to the inmates of the kingdom on high than ye are known to your own selves. It's interesting in this quote because he says we are better known to the inmates of the kingdom than we are known to our own selves. 
And I think of this often like when you're talking to a child, for example, you are aware often of the struggles that they are going through. You're aware of some of the intellectual obstacles that they are actually facing. In a sense, you might have a bird's eye view of this creature, <laughs> a child. And the same, I believe, what I understand from the writings, is the same from the next world. They are seeing a larger picture. They have a better comprehension of the grand scheme of things, even if there are grades and stations infinitely above them. But they themselves are able to know what it is that you are capable of, know your potentialities, and know the end result of the actions that you are currently undertaking. Whereas we are actually prevented because, if you will, the veil of the mother's tummy of the womb that we are in. Uh, the next quote is actually from Abdu'l-Baha. The animal cannot realize the intelligence of a human being. He only knows that which is perceived by his animal senses. He cannot imagine anything in the abstract. An animal could not learn that the world is round, that the earth revolves around the sun, or the construction of the electric telegraph. These things are only possible to man. Man is the highest work of creation, the nearest to God of all creatures. All superior kingdoms are incomprehensible to the inferior. How, therefore, could it be possible that the creature, man, should understand the Almighty Creator of all? That which we imagine is not the reality of God. He, the unknowable, the unthinkable, is far beyond the highest conception of man. Here again we have this notion of, if you will, the obstacles to the capacity of an intellect to understand and fully grasp a station that is above them. Uh, Abdu'l-Bahá here uses the um, analogy of an animal. And I've often joked in you know, giving talks or sitting around with friends, um, you know, my dog, for example, um, can know I'm there. He can fully be aware that I exist. Yet his capacity to really understand anything of the things that I'm saying other than walk or treat <laughs> Uh, is completely shielded from him. We could be having a profound discussion about physics, or a wonderful discussion about history, or the nobility of humankind, and to my dog, Cody, that is just a bunch of barking. It's very important because here the examples given by Abdu'l-Bahá are scientific knowledge, the electric telegraph, the roundness of the earth. There is no uh, advanced abstract reasoning within the animal kingdom. And this means that all superior kingdoms, quoting, are incomprehensible to the inferior. Now I believe this goes both for our comprehension of the worlds beyond, but also in those varieties, in those different stations of rank and capacity in the next world, we are in, basically, we are unable to comprehend those that are of a grade above us. When we view the world of creation, we discover differences in degree which make it impossible for the lower to comprehend the higher. For example, the mineral kingdom, no matter how much it may advance, can never comprehend the phenomena of the vegetable kingdom. Whatever development the vegetable may attain, it can have no message from nor come in touch with the kingdom of the animal. However perfect may be the growth of a tree, it cannot realize the sensation of sight, hearing, smell, taste, and touch. These are beyond its limitation. Although it is the possessor of existence in the world of creation, a tree, nevertheless, has no knowledge of the superior degree of the animal kingdom. Likewise, no matter how great the advancement of the animal, it can have no idea of the human plane no knowledge of intellect and spirit. Difference in degree is an obstacle to this comprehension. A lower degree cannot comprehend a higher, although all are in the same world of creation, whether mineral, vegetable, or animal. Degree is the barrier and limitation. In the human plane of existence, we can say we have knowledge of a vegetable, its qualities and product. But the vegetable has no knowledge or comprehension whatever of us. No matter how near perfection this rose may advance in its own sphere, it can never possess hearing and sight. 
Inasmuch as in the creational world, which is phenomenal, difference of degree is an obstacle or hindrance to comprehension, how can the human being, which is a created exigency, comprehend the ancient divine reality, which is essential? This is impossible because the reality of divinity is sanctified beyond the comprehension of the created being, man. So in here, once again, we see that the difference of degree is an obstacle to comprehension. That no matter how advanced a plant might be, it cannot comprehend the world of the senses. It can't understand sight, or hearing, or taste, or smell. And I believe this, this analogy is actually going to serve us well as we continue. Uh, and it's just like the analogy of the embryo. Because the embryo that's actually in the womb, um, that being itself has eyes, it has ears, it has a tongue, it has a nose, it has arms, it has legs, it has hands, it has feet. And in each of these cases, the function and purpose of those worlds of senses and mobility are not for the world of the womb. They are only once they are birthed into the next world that they actually can use them. And the analogy with the use of the Baha'i writings that if we don't develop them here, they're not ready for the next world. So that there is a sense, no pun intended, <laughs> that our senses actually have to be developed so that we can move about and understand the worlds beyond. And we're told here, like he says, that the animal, no matter how much it goes in the prior quote, cannot understand the concepts of abstract, abstract reasoning. They can't understand that the world is round. They can't understand uh, what electromagnetism is, for example. And this ends up being a block for them understanding the human kingdom. And just like in the next world, we might be encountering beings that actually are of a grade or station above us, and yet at the same time we still cannot fully grasp what they are. But wait a minute. The following quote from Some Answered Questions appears to cause some problems for our notion of not being able to see up and not having those senses. As to thy question regarding discoveries made by the soul after it hath put off its human form, certainly that world is a world of perceptions and discoveries. For the interposed veil will be lifted away, and the human spirit will gaze upon souls that are above, below, and on par with itself. It is similar to the condition of a human being in the womb, where his eyes are veiled and all things are hidden away from him. Once he is born out of the uterine world and entereth this life, he findeth it, with relation to that of the womb, to be a place of perceptions and discoveries, and he observeth all things through his outer eye. In the same way, once he hath departed this life, he will behold in that world whatsoever was hidden from him here. But there he will look upon and comprehend all things with his inner eye. There will he gaze on his fellows and his peers, and those in the ranks above him and those below. As for what is meant by the equality of souls in the all highest realm, it is this. The souls of the believers at the time when they first become manifest in the world of the body, are equal, and each is sanctified and pure. In this world, however, they will begin to differ one from another, some achieving the highest station, some a middle one, others remaining at the lowest stage of being. Their equal status is at the beginning of their existence. The differentiation followeth their passing away. So in this section, Abdu'l-Bahá says the human spirit will gaze upon souls that are above, below, and on a par with itself. As well, there he will gaze on fellows and his peers, and those in ranks above him, and those below. And we are told that the differentiation of humankind appears after our passing away. Um, this seems on the surface to take this idea of our inability to access or understand those above or see above and below. Um, it, it seems inconsistent. And I think, however, that the notions regarded to the sense organs and the sense capacities are themselves our gateway into understanding this. Now, I often imagine attempting to communicate an, into an individual 
uh, who is born blind, no capacity to see what colors actually are. And this seems on the surface like we would actually have a lot of avenues to do so. We can start, for example, using, say, something that is cold to communicate blue. Or we might use warmth to communicate redness. Uh, starting in a low heat, <laughs> if you will, with yellow and scaling it up to, to red and to burning hot. We can do the same thing with music. We can attempt, for example, to use notions of visual rising and falling. Um, to really give someone the ability to understand, if they're unable to hear, what music is like. We can use the sense of vibration, so someone can someone get a handle on what it is to be going up in pitch. Yet at the same time, these individuals, while being able to stand in front of someone who is not on a par with themselves in, this, in the world of, say, listening, hearing, or the world of sight, they can stand in front of this individual that is not on a par with themselves in these sense capacities and gain some understanding of what it is, yet no matter how much they do, they're going to be unable of truly estimating and comprehending, say, the profound beauty of a Van Gogh painting, or the shocking wonder of something written by Beethoven. Why? Because the vast array of that world of sound, or that vast world of music, or that world of colour, and visual representation is completely blocked off from them. So can they stand before someone, in the case of, say, their ability to sense the, the sound or sight, or someone who's not on a par with themselves? Yes, they can. And I think that actually such individuals would be able to, for example, look below them and see, well, wow, this individual is incapable of truly, truly accessing the world of tactile feeling. And I'm trying to communicate to this individual what it's like to feel something. Or, for example, someone who has a perfectly, if you will, uh, fluid and movement and graceful uh, physical spiritual body. This individual below them can't understand what it means to fly, or can't understand what it means to soar. And they're trying to communicate to this individual, and then they have another individual who's trying to communicate to them something which is, which is the analogue, if you will, of sound. They can intuit that there is a domain of senses, a domain and range of experience that they themselves are blocked off from, because they can see those below them, and that there is a domain that is actually blocked off from them, and they are attempting to communicate. I believe this gives us the ability to see that you can actually have multiple individuals within the same domain interacting with each other, those above and below and on a par, yet at the same time having those obstacles to comprehension, those obstacles to estimation, those obstacles to truly understanding the richness of this world, and I would add, therefore, the ability to deny their true reality. Another analogy, which I think gives us a way to understand this, um, is the example I gave previously of two brothers standing shoulder to shoulder on Main Street. One of those brothers, um, for example, um, being involved in drug dealing, in prostitution, in human trafficking, in theft. This individual who, for example, hates people of another color, loathes other cultures, and his identical twin brother standing next to him who is the antithesis of that first. This individual tries his best to understand the world of intellect, the science, history, psychology, sociology. At the same time, he uses everything that he has to the best of his ability to try and heal the world, to make it a better place. He sacrifices his time. Instead of going out to sell drugs, he goes out to help people of the homeless community. He speaks on equality of men and women, strives to unite people, to dissolve prejudices and hate, and even, again the antithesis of his brother, goes out and does what he can to understand other cultures, listen to their music, understand their religions, understand their philosophies and how they see the world. Now these two individuals stand side by side, and I would suggest that in one sense, yes, they are able to interact with each other. At the same time, they do not inhabit the same world. 
Now, in the physical sense, they might see the same things. For example, they might see a camera. One sees the ability to actually create pornography, something which is toxic to humankind. The other sees that same camera as the ability to bridge chasms between different cultures, between different races, between different religions, and sees it as a way to actually create beauty in the world. Once again, they don't see the same thing, even though they see the same thing. And obviously, one brother attempting to communicate the profound sweetness of finally being able to appreciate, say, a musical tradition that was foreign to him, or the ability to reach through the barriers of language and touch another person's heart from a different culture, or understand their philosophy, their worldview, their religion. This would fall on deaf ears to the other brother, because when he sees a human being, he sees a commodity. The other one sees a ray of light with the potential to unite the world. When one sees a woman, he sees an equal partner. He sees something in this individual that is just like what is in him, whereas the other brother actually sees, again, really something to be used, something either to be used as a sensual service to sell, or as a potential addicted customer. This is what I think are the barriers between these two grades of being. Another very sad analogy that can help us to understand um, the relationship of being in the next world, and not being able to access, if you will, or truly see, while at the same time being able to interact with those on a level higher than us, or on a par with us, um, is the problem of addiction. Uh, I have had the very, very sad, um, if you will, experience of both having been addicted to chemicals in my own past, as well as having, as well as having really lost friends uh, to the same kinds of addiction. When you're speaking to somebody who is in the throes of addiction, they can hear you. They can hear what you're saying. Yet at the same time, they don't hear you. They don't understand the meaning or the import of what it is that you're saying to them. They are, if you will, caged inside the addiction, while still being able to move about freely with you. Uh, very often I've had the experience of talking to friends and trying to communicate to them the beauty of the freedom of being out from under the shackles, if you will, of addiction. And they hear me. And some part of them actually really, really does know, because they remember that world, even if it's only a faint echo. At the same time, they don't hear me. Because if they did, they would drop the addiction. And as I said, I myself battled with addiction in my past, when I was in my 20s. Someone comes up to you and starts communicating how this is harming your body or preventing your mind from working properly. And there's a part of you that understands that but you can't fully hear them, or you can't fully see what they're saying. Um, and this is really the same issue. In the next world, if we had chosen to be the one brother who is himself dealing in human trafficking and drug dealing and drug abuse, um, we will estimate our own worth at the time of our death, and we would cast our own selves into the fire meaning we would understand why it is that we're being given the sense capacities in the bodies that we are, in accordance with our understanding, with our faith, and with our conduct. But once we're in that, if you will, vehicle in the next world, and someone begins to tell us of the melodies of righteousness, of the beautiful fragrance of service and sacrifice, we won't be able to smell it. We won't be able to hear those melodies. And in the end, this is why we are going to be able to actually turn away from them, even there. And I think this is why, if we take the analogy of the one quote from Shoghi Effendi in a previous video, where she tell, or sorry, where he tells the wife that her husband is beginning to see spiritual truth for what it really is, and appreciate the station of Baha'u'llah. It is because that individual obviously didn't develop 
those capacities in this world. He is somewhat developing them in the next world, but he moved from a place without those senses and moved into a vehicle, again, that did not have those senses. They can be cultured, they can be developed, they can be shared by analogy. We can communicate to people in such states the wondrous of the melodies, of the manifestations of God. But given they cannot actually properly hear them for their own selves, but only can get an inkling of them, they can still deny. The two origins of variation, inherent and chosen. The following is from Abdu'l-Bah. As for material beings, they are not to be blamed, judged, or held accountable for their own degrees and stations. Thus the mineral, the plant, and the animal are each acceptable in their own degree. But if they were to remain deficient in that degree, they would be blameworthy, the degree itself being wholly perfect. Now the differences among mankind are twofold. One is a difference of degree, and this difference is not blameworthy. The other is a difference with respect to faith and certitude, the absence of which is blameworthy. For the soul must have fallen prey to its own lusts and passions, to have been deprived of this bounty, and bereft of the attractive power of the love of God. However praiseworthy and acceptable it may be in its human degree, Yet, as it is deprived of the perfections of that degree, it has become a source of deficiency and is held accountable for that reason. So in this quote, we're told that there are different origins of the variation and diversity of stations in the next world. Um, there is no doubt that in this world, we do not all have the same capacities. We, want, we might really want to wish that were true, uh, but it's not the case. Um, I have met individuals in my life that have a much higher intellectual capacity than my own. I have met individuals who seem at least to have a greater immediacy of their ability to be emotionally stable, with higher levels of physical prowess. And I know some of these are related to the very nature of the vehicle into which I have been placed in this world. I do not, however, believe that any of these capacities, the limits on any of these capacities, are salvation-related, to use that term. An individual, no matter what their capacity, can recognize truth and beauty and purpose. They can find it, and they can actually seize upon it. They can, if you will, using the analogy of the quote from the Bob about each each station or each degree having within it its own levels of perfection, the levels of perfection within the mineral or the plant or the animal and the human. Within the capacity of our own selves, we have perfections that we can acquire, and we are judged on whether or not we develop these perfections. That is when the end, where we're really coming to the place of those that are chosen. I think that human beings are far, far, far more aware of what actual evil is and what darkness is, of what we're capable of ourselves, and in both directions, depravity and nobility, that generally we know and can sense that there is a station above ourselves of knowledge and of nobility that we can actually achieve. And it is upon this that we are actually truly judged. Now let us consider the soul. We have seen that movement is essential to existence. Nothing that has life is without motion. All creation, whether of the mineral, vegetable, or animal kingdom, is compelled to obey the law of motion. It must either ascend or descend. But with the human soul there is no decline. Its only movement is towards perfection. Growth and progress alone constitute the motion of the soul. In the world of the spirit there is no retrogression. The world of mortality is a world of contradictions, of opposites. Motion being compulsory, everything must either go forward or retreat. In the realm of spirit there is no retreat possible. 
all movement is bound to be towards a perfect state. Progress is the expression of spirit in the world of matter. The intelligence of man, his reasoning powers, his knowledge, his scientific achievements, all these being manifestations of the spirit, partake of the inevitable law of spiritual progress and are therefore of necessity immortal. In this quote, we are told that with the human soul there is no decline. That the only movement is towards perfection, and growth and progress alone constitute the motion of the soul. There is no retreat possible, which is also said. And then it says that the intelligence of man, his reasoning powers, his knowledge, his scientific achievements, partake of the inevitable law of spiritual progress. So it sounds as if, in the domains above, that there is no retrogression in the cosmos. And we have to understand this within the context of all the other quotes that we actually find. That an individual, really early on in this series, I think in one of the, uh, the first lectures, in stage one, it's said that an individual can start and progress along and yet at the last moment fall to the lowest level and not know. Um, this would actually not know you're in hell in one of the other stages. Now, In this context it means on the one hand we can, and on the other hand we can't. So how do we actually reconcile this? I think one of the ways to offer how we can reconcile this is that there are infinite worlds of God. We are told that actually we move through worlds of God. And in a sense, there are membranes between these worlds. We are told, in this case, that there is a membrane, if you will, between the world we are in and the world we're going to. Um, that threshold is death. We develop in this life, if you will, the embryo of our body, the vehicle we will inhabit in the next world. And as we actually reach death, we are still being able to actually, if you will, develop and foster that body. When we pass, we move into it. And in that world we assume the form uh, consummate, or sorry, commensurate with what actually we have done in this life. And I think this gives us a way to understand how there can be no retrogression, and at the same time how we can fall. When we move into the next world, we can move along a path of spiritual perfections. We can come to recognize truths we never did before. We can recognize beauties we had never seen before. We can learn to hear the melodies of justice. We can learn to smell the fragrance of self-sacrifice, even if in the previous life we were not able. It may be difficult because we have the veil of a lack of senses, but we're told specifically within the Baha'i writings that we can progress. Now, I would suggest the ability to fall back to the first level is within each world. But when we move to another world, there are realizations that are suddenly forced upon us in another judgment. For example, uh, I've been asked before in a, a fireside if I believe that someone who is an atheist, uh, when they die, um, well, they know, they'll obviously know that there is a God. And I had once said, well, I'm not entirely sure about that. They would definitely know that there's something after death, <laughs> that there is actually a stage beyond but there might still be a doubt as to whether there is one ultimate supreme entity behind, if you will, behind the scenes of it all. That's for another time. Uh, but in this case, I use it as an example, is if in this world you denied that you had an existence after the destruction of the physical body, or the abstract aspects, the intangible aspects of our human reality, those being our virtues and our intellect could move on, you're going to find out you were wrong. Now, there's no ability at that point to actually deny that there is a life beyond. It has, if you will, been forced upon you. And I believe if we look into the writings more deeply on this subject, we'll realize that we do find that actually there are certain truths and certain realities that are forced beyond us uh, in our passage from world to world. And some of that will come up later on in this and in subsequent lectures. Um, and this gives us the ability to see how we can fall to the lowest depths and not know within a certain world, within a certain life, yet at the same time there is a progress that is, if you will, inevitable, that is forced upon us. 
Um, I would suggest how else can we make sense of this, given we're told that this world is a mirror or a reflection of the next, and we can see that people actually can, if you will, go backwards in their spiritual progress. They can turn from being a very good person to a very bad person. They can lose their knowledge, they can even ignore their own capacities. Yet that there will be, if you will, that reckoning, that stage of existence where they pass from the threshold of this life to the next, and they will be forced to realize, and certain things they will not be able to remove from their memory. This is also related, I believe, to this notion of uh, stagnation. That this inevitable law of progress does continue, if you will, updating us through our moving through these different membranes, these different veils of world to world, but we can within a world truly, truly stagnate. Um, I myself, and I think most of us, have known people who you know, got to a certain level of, uh, if you will, maturity, a certain level of intellect, a certain level of emotional maturity, or spiritual maturity in the sense of our virtues and our vision of the great purpose of existence, and they never move past it. They can actually stay within this domain, and I think once again the same is true of the next world. At times in studying any subject within the Baha'i writings we can come across a certain quote. And it really grips us, and it stands out to us, and we take that to be, if you will, the penultimate statement. And we have to be wary of this. Uh, there is one quote where the Guardian says that uh, oftentimes we see two concepts uh, that seem at odds with each other, but if we follow them through, we will see that they are united. Which means at times we can find one quote that seems to suggest one thing, but the actual full truth of it is the case, if you will. It's the reason I, I do my best to try and make sure that there is a lot of quotes within these talks, and to share as much as I can, but I know myself um, throughout my Baha'i life, I've been a Baha'i for 20 years, and I've been studying it for 20 years, I consistently find that something I previously thought was bang on true was wrong. <laughs> and I'm sure that if I'm doing uh, this right, meaning uh, doing my best to understand the Baha'i writings and grow as an individual, that many of the things I say now will be seen as wrong, and even immature in the future. Um, I think this is the case with one concept that has often arisen in discussions about the next world, and that is, is that we do not have free will in the next world. It's like the one where we you know there's no sense of the physical or no sense of time that we have looked at previously, um, that it doesn't seem to be what often we take it to be. So this is the, the question really about a, a quote from Abdu'l-Bahá where he talks about the means of progress in the next world, that of the grace, of the manifestation of God, uh, of prayer or deeds done on our behalf. And I would suggest really this is just, not just, uh, this is the great discussion about the relationship between grace and works. Unto each one has been prescribed a preordained measure as decreed in God's mighty and guarded tablets. All that which ye potentially possess can, however, be manifested only as a result of your own volition. Your own acts testify to this truth." Uh, in this quote we're told that where you can only manifest the prescribed measure that we have been given uh, according to our own volition. So it takes our own volition to really bring out the minds or the gems placed within us. The following quote um, is from Baha'u'llah as well. And now concerning thy question whether human souls continue to be conscious one of another after their separation from the body. Know thou that the souls of the people of Baha, who have entered and been established within the crimson ark, shall associate and commune intimately one with another and shall be so closely associated in their lives, their aspirations, their aims and strivings, as to be even as one soul." In this quote, it's talking about the people of Baha, and that in the worlds beyond we will actually be closely associated in lives, aspirations, aims, and strivings, which means that we will actually have aspirations, aims, and strivings, um, and that once again, I would suggest there is the issue of volition here, because those capacities, those perfections we have in those worlds beyond, can once again only be manifested as a result of our own volition. But then again we have quotes like the following. 
The tenderness of thy mercy, O my Lord, surpasseth the fury of thy wrath, and thy loving kindness exceedeth thy hot displeasure, and thy grace excelleth thy justice. Hold thou through thy wondrous favors and mercies the hands of thy creatures, and suffer them not to be separated from the grace which thou hast ordained as a means thereby they can recognize thee. Here we have the statement by Baha'u'llah that it is the grace which thou hast ordained as the means whereby they can recognize thee. So it actually seems here that it is only by grace that we actually recognize the manifestations of God. Or in one sense, it's the grace by which we can recognize God himself. And this is a question um, that, if you will, deals with the issues of justice and grace in the next world, and it's going to recur later on. But we see that in some sense it's only by a result of our own volition, and at the same time it is only through grace. But note here that it is only through His grace that we recognize Him. For the highest and most excelling grace bestowed upon men is the grace of attaining unto the presence of God and of His recognition, which has been promised unto all people. This is the utmost degree of grace vouchsafed unto man by the All-Bountiful, the Ancient of Days, and the fullness of His absolute bounty upon His creatures. So in this quote, the highest and most excelling grace bestowed upon men is attaining unto the presence of God and His recognition. Once again, it is through His grace that we have been able to actually recognize the manifestation of God and attain His presence. In the following quote, we're told that it is through the grace and power of the Holy Spirit that we are actually able to progress, for the power of man is limited and the divine power is boundless. Here from Abdu Baha. In the teachings of Baha'u'llah it is written, By the power of the Holy Spirit alone is man able to progress. For the power of man is limited, and the divine power is boundless. The reading of history brings us to the conclusion that all truly great men, the benefactors of the human race, those who have moved men to love the right and hate the wrong, and who have caused real progress, all these have been inspired by the force of the Holy Spirit. As to the soul of man after death, it remains. So it is the inspiration of the Holy Spirit and God's grace that propels us. And this is actually a really deep and rich concept in how the relationship of the Holy Spirit and the manifestations of God actually influence individual lives and also the timeline of history uh, for another time. For now, we're going to move to another quote from Abdu Baal. As to the soul of man after death, it remains in the degree of purity to which it has evolved during life in the physical body. And after it is freed from the body, it remains plunged in the ocean of God's mercy. From the moment of the soul leaves the body and arrives in the heavenly world, its evolution is spiritual. And that evolution is the approaching unto God. In the physical creation, evolution is from one degree of perfection to another. The mineral passes with its mineral perfections to the vegetable. The vegetable, with its perfections, passes to the animal world, and so on to that of humanity. This world is full of seeming contradictions. In each of these kingdoms, mineral, vegetable, and animal, life exists in its degree. Though when compared to the life in a man, the earth appears to be dead, yet she too lives and has a life of her own. In this world things live and die, and live again in other forms of life, but in the world of the spirit it is quite otherwise. The soul does not evolve from degree to degree as a law, it only evolves nearer to God, by the mercy and bounty of God. So in this quote, we're told that the soul of man after death uh, remains in the degree of purity to which it has evolved during life. We pass away, 
we have, if you will, this reckoning, the sudden realization of our true reality, and we are given a body. In this body, we then move through the worlds beyond. And this world has these degrees. And in each of these degrees, we actually have perfections that we can actually acquire. Heron has brought this notion at the same time of this degrees of existence. He says, for example, that life exists in each, in each degree, that when compared to the life of man, the earth appears to be dead, yet she too lives and has a life of her own. This gives us once again that notion that you can have different grades and stations in the next world. But it says here that the soul does not evolve from degree to degree as a law. It only evolves nearer to God by the mercy and the bounty of God. So you have these different degrees and stations. You have them here, you have them in the next world, and you also have infinite worlds of God with degrees and stations. And in some sense, it is only through the grace of God that we actually move from one of these kingdoms unto the other. In like manner, the holy manifestations of God are the focal centers of the light of truth, the wellsprings of the hidden mysteries, and the source of the effusions of divine love. They cast their effulgence upon the realm of hearts and minds, and bestow grace everlasting upon the world of the spirits. They confer spiritual life and shine with the splendor of inner truths and meanings. The enlightenment of the realm of thought proceeds from those centers of light and exponents of mysteries. Were it not for the grace of the revelation and instruction of those sanctified beings, the world of souls and the realm of thought would become darkness upon darkness. Were it not for the sound and true teachings of those exponents of mysteries, the human world would become the arena of animal characteristics and qualities. All existence would become a vanishing illusion, and true life would be lost. That is why it is said in the Gospel, in the beginning was the Word, that is, it was the source of all life. In this quote, it's interesting because we're told it is the grace of their of the revelation and instruction of their sound and true teachings that we actually progress, and that the human world would become an arena of animal characteristics and qualities. A statement related to kingdom, one being human and one being animal or animalistic. In this sense, we get once again a gateway into understanding what's actually being said. The grace of God, which enables us to progress, is actually through the instruction and teaching of the manifestations of God. Why? Because we do not earn the coming of Christ, if you will. We do not earn through our good works the revelation of the Buddha, or of the Prophet Muhammad, or of Krishna, or of the Bab and Baha'u'llah. It is purely by the grace and bounty of God that his manifestations of God are sent here, and we can then actually recognize them by their grace, through them being sent, through our own volition, and begin to ascend from the animal world, the world of baser qualities, into the realm of the human. Those of the human qualities of abstract reasoning, of scientific understanding, of the virtues of the human kind, of self-sacrifice. So here we get an insight into what it means by it being purely by their grace. We turn now to a concept of what it means to know God. This first quote is from One Common Faith, a publication from the Baha'i World Center. What is it meant by knowledge of God? Baha'u'llah explains, is knowledge of the manifestations who reveal his will and attributes. And it is here that the soul comes into intimate association with a creator who is otherwise beyond both language and apprehension. I bear witness is Baha'u'llah's assertion about the station of the manifestation of God, that through thy beauty, the beauty of the adored one hath been unveiled, and through thy face, the face of the desired one hath shown forth. Here we are told that the knowledge of God means the knowledge of the manifestations who reveal his will and attributes. Um, if there's anything, once again, that is a very profoundly, profoundly rich notion within the Baha'i writings. It is what it means to know God. 
in very quick summary, it is the knowledge of God's messenger within the world of creation that we are living in. It is being able to see the reflection of his will and attributes in this world through the person of a divine messenger. It has been demonstrated and definitely established through clear evidences that by resurrection is meant the rise of the manifestation of God to proclaim his cause, and by attainment unto the divine presence is meant attainment unto the presence of his beauty in the person of his manifestation. Here again we're told that it is attainment unto the presence of his beauty in the person of his manifestation. These prophets and chosen ones of God are the recipients and revealers of all the unchangeable attributes and names of God. They are the mirrors that truly and faithfully reflect the light of God. Whatsoever is applicable to them is in reality applicable to God himself, who is both the visible and the invisible. The knowledge of him who is the origin of all things and attainment unto him are impossible save through knowledge of and attainment unto these luminous beings who proceed from the Son of Truth. By attaining, therefore, to the presence of these holy luminaries, the presence of God himself is attained. From their knowledge, the knowledge of God is revealed, and from the light of their countenance, the splendor of the face of God is made manifest. In this quote, we're actually told that they are mirrors. This is an analogy, once again, that is repeatedly used within the Baha'i writings. That actually the manifestations of God are themselves a mirror reflecting a divine sun. That divine sun, as we'll see in other uh, uh, deepenings, is not God himself, but the manifestation of God, reflected in the person of the different historical manifestations. And it's said here that it is impossible, the knowledge of God, is impossible save through knowledge of and attainment unto these luminous beings who proceed from the Son of Truth. So when we're talking about knowing God, remember this, it is impossible save through a messenger, one of these luminous beings, a manifestation of God. This world is a mirror of the next. It's nature and it's history. The worlds of God are in perfect harmony and correspondence one with another. Each world in this limitless universe is, as it were, a mirror reflecting the history and nature of all the rest. The physical universe is, likewise, in perfect correspondence with the spiritual or divine realm. The world of matter is an outer expression or facsimile of the inner kingdom of spirit. The world of minds corresponds with the world of hearts. I think this quote gives us a lot of ability once again to access understandings of the worlds beyond. And many can be teased out by looking at it, but what is this saying? That each world of this limitless universe is a mirror reflecting the history and the nature of the rest. So it's not just that there are laws, if you will, within this world that are facsimiles or shadows or mirrors of laws in the worlds beyond, but at the same time there is in some sense, and this is the important part, it is reflecting the history and nature of all the rest. How is this done? The next quote is from Abdu'l Baha in London. As a Persian poet has written, the celestial universe is so formed that the underworld reflects the upper world. That is to say, whatever exists in heaven is reflected in this phenomenal world. Now, praise be to God, this meeting of ours is a reflection of the heavenly concourse. It is as though we had taken a mirror and had gazed into it. This reflection from the heavenly concourse we know as love. As heavenly love exists in the supreme concourse, even so it is reflected here. The supreme concourse is filled with a desire for God. Thank God this desire is also here. 
Therefore, if we say that this meeting is heavenly, it is true. Why? Because we have no other desire except for that which comes from God. We have no other object save the commemoration of God. The spiritual world is like unto the phenomenal world. They are the exact counterpart of each other. Whatever objects appear in this world of existence are the outer pictures of the world of heaven. So in here, the quote Abdu'l-Baha used is that the celestial universe is so formed that the underworld reflects the upper world. And then he says, whatever exists in heaven is reflected in this phenomenal world. So how, I would ask, is the seeking of God and the finding of his manifestations reflected here? How is difference of belief and station that we find here reflected there? Many of the quotes we've actually looked at give us an understanding of this. For now we will continue to gather some more, if you will, quotes and notions before we bring them together. Work in the Kingdom those who have passed on through death have a sphere of their own. It is not removed from ours. Their work, the work of the kingdom, is ours. But it is sanctified from what we call time and place. So in this quote we're told that they work there for the kingdom. Now, it is sanctified from what we call time and place, a notion that we've seen in one of the earlier stages, that we reckon, as Abdu'l-Baha says, the passage of time by our son. And we reckon place very differently than they will. And the point here is, their work, the work of the kingdom, is ours. In some sense, those who have passed beyond and who are believers are doing what we're doing. Can a departed soul converse with someone still on earth? A conversation can be held, but not as our conversation. There is no doubt that the forces of the higher worlds interplay with the forces of this plane. The heart of man is open to inspiration. This is spiritual communication. As in a dream one talks with a friend while the mouth is silent, so is it in the conversation of the spirit. A man may converse with the ego within him, saying, May I do this? Would it be advisable for me to do this work? Such as this is conversation with the higher self. We are told here that the forces of the higher world interplay with the forces of this plane. As humanity's purpose includes the carrying forward of an ever-advancing civilization, not the least of the extraordinary powers that religion possesses has been its ability to free those who believe from the limitations of time itself, eliciting from them sacrifices on behalf of generations, centuries into the future. Indeed, because the soul is immortal, its awakening to its true nature empowers it, not only in this world, but even more directly in those worlds that lie beyond to serve the evolutionary process. The light which these souls radiate, Baha'u'llah asserts, is responsible for the progress of the world and the advancement of its peoples. All things must needs have a cause, a motive power, an animating principle. These souls and symbols of detachment have provided, and will continue to provide, the supreme moving impulse in the world of being. And this quote is fascinating because in one sense it says that we are free from the limitation of time itself because we are listening sacrifices on behalf of generations in the centuries to come. And in some sense when we actually engage with the true teachings of a cause that will one day win, if you will, that we are actually serving humanity far off. Anyone who has worked in the development uh, of social activism, uh, or in the world even of the sciences, can recognize this notion that by interacting in this world with causes 
that will actually grow and develop and, if you will, flower out through history, but we are working on behalf of those in the future. At the same time here it says, not only in this world, but even more directly in those worlds that lie beyond, we serve the evolutionary process. That these souls and symbols of detachment have provided and will continue to provide the supreme moving impulse in the world of being. So when we actually seize upon our purpose, our teleology in this world, to solve the true, the good, and the beautiful, that yes, we are actually interplaying on the planes of history, but at the same time, we are actually developing the capacities and capabilities that we are going to continue to use in the world beyond, because their work is our work. The topic of the great beyond is by far one of my favorite topics. And this subtopic within it is one of my favorite of the favorite. Uh, and it is guidance in the other worlds of God. The first quote is from Baha'u'llah. That city is none other than the word of God, revealed in every age in dispensation. In the day of Moses, it was the Pentateuch. In the days of Jesus, the Gospel. In the days of Muhammad, the Messenger of God, the Quran. In this day, the Bayan. And in the dispensation of him whom God will make manifest his own book, the book unto which all the books of former dispensations must needs be referred, the book which standeth amongst them all transcendent and supreme. In these cities spiritual sustenance is bountifully provided, and incorruptible delights have been ordained. The food they bestow is the bread of heaven, and the spirit they impart is God's imperishable blessing. Upon detached souls they bestow the gift of unity, enrich the destitute, and offer the cup of knowledge unto him who wander in the wilderness of ignorance. All the guidance, the blessings, the learning, the understanding, the faith, and certitude conferred upon all that is in heaven and on earth are hidden and treasured within these cities. Remember first that we were talking about this world mirroring the history and the nature of those beyond. And here he says that all the guidance, speaking of these cities of God, these books um, of the, each dispensation, all the guidance, the blessings, the learnings, the understandings, the faith and certitude conferred upon all that is in heaven and on earth. That we are actually seeing, I would suggest, the reflections of something above where faith, again, and certitude are needed in heaven. And that these cities seem to exist there as they do here, a mirror reflecting the history and nature of the rest. Another quote from the Epistle of the Son of the Wolf by Baha'u'llah. Therefore the voice of the true faith was lifted up, calling aloud again and again, and saying, O concourse of the earth, by God, I am the true faith of God amongst you. Beware that ye deny me not. God hath manifested me with a light that hath encompassed all that are in the heavens and all that are on the earth. We are told here that his light encompassed all that are in heaven and all that are on earth, of course. And this is reflected here as it is there, is it not? And the day star of thy grace has shone forth with such brilliance that thou didst manifest him who is the revealer of thyself and the treasury of thy wisdom and the dawning place of thy majesty and power. Thou didst establish his covenant with everyone who hath been created in the kingdoms of earth and heaven and in the realms of revelation and of creation. This quote is a very powerful quote because it says that God established his covenant with everyone who had been created in the kingdoms of earth and heaven, in the realms of revelation and creation. I would suggest these are talking about very, very particular things. Um, and as we get into Baha'i's cosmology, meaning the study of the realms and existence beyond, that we will see some of these topics come up again. For now, we see that the communication of God is in all the worlds of God, the realm of revelation and of creation.
the realm of heaven and earth, and that this covenant has been established in all of them. We see this notion, I would suggest, echoed in many prayers. This one from Bahá'u'lláh. I beseech thee so to enrich me, as to dispense with all save thee, and be made independent of any one except thyself. Rain down, then, upon me, out of the clouds of thy bounty, that which shall profit me in every world of thy worlds. In this prayer, he is asking to be given that which will profit him in every world of his worlds. Write down, then, for me, in every world of thine, that which will enable me to enter beneath the sh thy shadow and within the borders of thy court. He here says, write down for me which will enable me to enter beneath thy shadow and within the borders of thy court, in every world. Again from Bahá'u'lláh. I implore thee, O thou the King of kings, and the pitier of the downtrodden, to ordain for them the good of this world and of the world to come. Write down for them, moreover, what none of thy creatures hath discovered, and number them with those who have circled round thee, and who move about thy throne in every world of thy worlds. We hear that there are those who move about thy throne in every world of thy worlds. This means that, in, again in the picture, there is a throne in every world of God, innumerable. And that there are those who circle around that throne in that world. And that in many of the prayers we actually say on a regular basis, we're asked to be given that which will actually enable us to find what profits us in every world, which would be his throne. Rain down then upon us, O my God, that which beseemeth thy grace and befitteth thy bounty. Enable us then, O my God, to live in remembrance of thee and to die in love of thee, and supply us with the gift of thy presence in thy worlds hereafter, worlds which are inscrutable to all except thee. Thou art our Lord and the Lord of all worlds, and the God of all that are in heaven and all that are on earth. So we are asking in this prayer to supply us with the gift of thy presence in thy worlds hereafter world's inscrutable. It is a prayer asking for the presence of God, and I propose that this presence is the very throne of God. And we'll see as well that the manifestations, we've seen one small example of it, and the light of the manifestations is actually in all the worlds of God. O Temple of Holiness, we verily have cleansed thy breast from the whispering of the people and sanctified it from earthly illusions, that the light of my beauty may appear therein and be reflected in the mirrors of all the worlds." So the beauty of God, in this quote, is actually reflected in the mirror of all the worlds. We now hear from the Bob. All praise be to God, who hath, through the power of truth, sent down this book unto his servant, that it may serve as a shining light for all mankind. Verily, this is none other than the sovereign truth. It is the path which God hath laid out for all that are in heaven and on earth. Let him then, who will, take for himself the right path unto his Lord." It's fascinating in this quote because here the Bob says that this is a path laid out for all that are in heaven and all that are on earth. That his revelation is, if you will, a journey that people can take, and I would stress can take, for them to actually draw nigh unto the presence of God and be those who can circle around his throne in every world. And so in this section, uh, titled The Manifestation in All the Worlds, we're going to begin with one quote from Baha'u'llah. O people, I swear by the one true God, this is the ocean out of which all seas have proceeded, and with which every one of them will ultimately be united. From him all the sons have been generated, and unto him they will all return. Through his potency the trees of divine revelation have yielded their fruits, 
every one of which has been sent down in the form of a prophet, bearing a message to God's creatures in each of the worlds whose number God alone in his all-encompassing knowledge can reckon. This quote clearly states that a message has been sent to each of the worlds of God in the form of a prophet. That every single world of God, which are infinite, receives a message from the divine in the form of a manifestation of God. This next quote is from Abdu'l-Bahá. What is he in need of in the kingdom, which transcends a life and limitation of this mortal sphere? That world beyond is a world of sanctity and radiance. Therefore, it is necessary that in this world he should acquire these divine attributes. In that world there is a need of spirituality, faith, assurance, the knowledge and love of God. These he must attain in this world, so that after his ascension from the earthly to the heavenly kingdom, he shall find all that is needful in that eternal life ready for him. We can see in some sense why now that Abdu'l-Bahá says that we are in need, uh, in need of faith and assurance in all the worlds of God, why these characteristics actually have to be developed here in this life and are needed in the next life, because in the next life there will be a manifestation of God in that world. In fact, as we've just heard from Baha'u'llah, in every single world. And since there can be no tie of direct intercourse to bind the one true God with his creation, and no resemblance whatever can exist between the transient and the eternal, the contingent and the absolute, he hath ordained that in every age and dispensation a pure and stainless soul be made manifest in the kingdoms of earth and heaven. Led by the light of unfailing guidance, and invested with supreme sovereignty, they are commissioned to use the inspiration of their words, the effusions of their infallible grace, and the sanctifying breeze of their revelation, for the cleansing of every longing heart and receptive spirit, from the dross and dust of earthly cares and limitations. From the foregoing passages and allusions, it has been made indubitably clear that in the kingdoms of earth and heaven there must needs be manifested a being, an essence who shall act as a manifestation and vehicle for the transmission of the grace of the divinity itself, the sovereign Lord of all. Through the teachings of this day star of truth, every man will advance and develop until he attaineth the station at which he can manifest all the potential forces with which his inmost true self hath been endowed. So once again in this quote, it actually states that in the kingdoms of earth and heaven there needs to be a manifestation of God. Why? Because there can be no direct intercourse, and that it is necessary that a being can act as the vehicle or the transmission of God's grace and divinity itself in all the worlds of God. To man, the essence of God is incomprehensible. So also are the worlds beyond this, and their condition. It is given to man to obtain knowledge, to attain to great spiritual perfection, to discover hidden truths and to manifest even the attributes of God. But still man cannot comprehend the essence of God. Where the ever-widening circle of man's knowledge meets the spiritual world, a manifestation of God is sent to mirror forth his splendor. So in this quote from Abdu'l-Bahá, we are told that there are spiritual worlds beyond this one, and that they are if you will, blocked off from us. We're unable to directly access them. And whenever the ever-widening circle of man's knowledge meets the spiritual world, a manifestation of God is sent to mirror forth his splendor. So in, if we look at the world as being a series of successive layers, successive levels of creation, successive levels of reality, we see that whenever we are actually separate from that one which is above us, this necessitates a vehicle for the transmission of God's infinite grace, and for a divinity itself into that world in the form of a prophet. And should anyone inscribe with true faith but one letter of that revelation, 
his recompense would be greater than for inscribing all the heavenly writings of the past and all that had been written during previous dispensations. Likewise continue thou to ascend through one revelation after another, knowing that thy progress in the knowledge of God shall never come to an end, even as it can have no beginning. In this quote he says, Likewise continue thou to ascend through one revelation after another, knowing that the progress in the knowledge of God shall never come to an end. So the progress of our soul in approaching God and coming to know Him will never end, and we continue to ascend through each of these worlds. What's fascinating here is that the Bob actually says we continue to ascend through one revelation after another. So if we begin to look at this, we have these multiple infinite layers of God, or sorry, infinite layers of worlds. Within each of these worlds there is a manifestation of God, and we ascend through each of these worlds as we ascend through each of these revelations. We will have experience of God's Spirit through His prophets in the next world, but God is too great for us to know without His intermediary. The prophets know God, but how is more than our human minds can grasp? We believe we attain in the next world to seeing the prophets. So in this quote, the Shoghi Effendi again tells us, that we always come to know God, even in the next world, through an intermediary, through one of his prophets of God. Indeed, were all the inhabitants of earth and heaven, and whatever existeth between them, to assemble together, they would utterly fail and be powerless to produce such a book, even though we made them masters of eloquence and learning on earth. Since thou dost adduce proofs from the Koran, God shall, with proofs from that self-same book, vindicate himself in the Bayan, the Bob's book. This is none other than a decree of God. He is truly the all-knowing, the all-powerful. If thou art of them that truly believe, thou hast no other alternative than to bear allegiance unto it. This is the way of God for all the inhabitants of earth and heaven, and all that lieth betwixt them. In this quote from the Bab, he says this individual is producing proofs from the Quran, and God shall, with proofs from that self-same book, vindicate himself in the Bayan. So the previous dispensation is being used as a justification and rationale for the truth of the subsequent revelation. For example, using the New Testament to testify to the prophethood of uh, Prophet Muhammad, or using the Old Testament to testify, for example, to the truth of Jesus Christ. And in this case, it says this is the way of God for all the inhabitants of earth and heaven, and all that lieth between them. So these manifestations of God, appearing in each of the worlds of God, as a vehicle for the transmission of the grace of God and of divinity itself, where these different layers have blocked our view of the greater reality that we are in, there must needs be a being who will actually manifest and share that message to all the worlds of God. The truth of that most recent message is being demonstrated through a previous dispensation, and this is the way in every world of God. Listen to this passage from the Long Obligatory Prayer. Make my prayer, O my Lord, a fountain of living waters, whereby I may live as long as thy sovereignty endureth, and may make mention of thee in every world of thy worlds. Here in the Long Obligatory Prayer, uh, those who pray this prayer regularly, it says that you're asking God that you may make mention of thee in every world of thy worlds. There are many prayers like this where we're asking if we can actually declare God's grace and divinity itself in every world of God. The content of this prayer, I believe, is hoping to be able to proclaim the true, most recent faith, the message of that manifestation of God in every world. He wishes you both to convey to your dear mother his heartfelt sympathy on so great a loss, and he feels sure you will both do all in your power to lighten her sorrow. 
For those who remain behind, death is a hard blow indeed. But for such a soul as your father, it is only a step into a new and glorious life. A life of freedom to be near the eternal beloved and to serve the cause of God in those realms of height he has passed to. Your father's constant prayer was that you both should serve the cause of God, and the guardian is confident that you will carry out his wishes and thus bring joy to his spirit. He will surely be always watching over you now, closer even than he was in life, and seeking to guide and help you. You could find no better path in life than to follow in his footsteps and live up to his example. I loved him very much, for he was delightful to converse with, and as a companion second to none. One night not long ago, I saw him in the world of dreams. Although his frame had always been massive, in the dream world he appeared larger and more corpulent than ever. It seemed as if he had returned from a journey. I said to him, Jinab, you have grown good and stout. Yes, he answered. Praise be to God. I have been in places where the air was fresh and sweet, and the water crystal pure. The landscapes were beautiful to look upon, the foods delectable. It all agreed with me, of course, so I am stronger than ever now, and I have recovered the zest of my early youth. The breasts of the all-merciful blew over me, and all my time was spent in telling of God. I have been setting forth his proofs and teaching his faith. The meaning of teaching the faith in the next world is spreading the sweet saviors of holiness. That action is the same as teaching. We spoke together a little more, and then some people arrived, and he disappeared. In this first quote uh, from The Guardian, we hear that an individual who has passed into the realms above, and he is actually serving the cause somehow there. Um, and then in the second passage from Memorials of the Faithful, we hear of Mullah Ali Akbar and Abdul Baha communicating that this individual in the realms beyond, who has passed beyond, is setting forth, setting forth his proofs and teaching the faith. Meaning, in the worlds beyond, as we've seen, we, individuals will not know that they were wrong. They will not have a full awareness of the truth. So teaching and demonstration and proving from the prior revelation, or prior revelations, I think we will see, is actually being carried on in all the worlds of God. That is why the development that we take care of in this life, which necessitates service, teaching, faith, assurance, setting forth proofs, the development of all these virtues, are truly and genuinely vital for each of the worlds of God. Because in each of those worlds of God, there is a manifestation sent down. One who I think we will see, we actually will need to find again. So this next section we call Detached from All the Worlds Beyond. The cause of God hath come as a token of His grace. Happy are they who act, happy are they who understand, happy the man that hath clung unto the truth, detached from all that is in the heavens and all that is on earth. Indeed, shouldst thou desire to confer blessing upon a servant, thou wouldst blot out from the realm of his heart every mention or disposition except thine own mention. And shouldst thou ordain evil for a servant by reason of that which his hands have unjustly wrought before thy face, thou wouldst test him with the benefits of this world and of the next, that he might become preoccupied therewith and forget thy remembrance. In the first quote we listen to, it states that happy the man that hath clung unto the truth, detached from all that is in heaven and all that is on earth. So there is a necessity for the true happiness of, an, of a soul. One must be detached from the worlds beyond. In the second, it says that if God wished to actually ordain evil for a servant, by reason of that which his hands have unjustly wrought, 
what would he do? He would test him with the benefits of this world and the next. So there are benefits and bounties in the next world that in the first quote we have to be detached from. We hear in this quote from the Bob that the benefits and the beauties and wonders of the world beyond, or I would add, of the worlds beyond, can themselves be a test which can ensnare a soul and keep him from the truth. Yeah, the seeker reacheth a station wherein that which hath been ordained for him knoweth no bounds. The fire of love so blazeth in his heart that it seizeth the reins of constraint from his grasp. At every moment his love for his Lord increaseth and draweth him nearer unto his Creator, in such wise that if his Lord be in the east of nearness, and he dwell in the west of remoteness, and possess all that earth and heaven contain of rubies and gold, he would forsake it all and rush forth to the land of the desired one. In this quote it's talking about how a true seeker, a true servant, can reach a place where the fire of love blazeth so much in their heart that it seizes the reins of constraint, and all that is in heaven and on earth of rubies and gold, he would push them aside. Once again, this notion that in the worlds beyond there are beauties and wonders, just like in this world, that can attract our attention and draw us away from the true goal of that domain. And remember, in that domain there is going to be a message from God in the form of a manifestation of God. And all around will be these, if you will, the analogy being landscapes, of things that can draw our attention away from him. I swear by the truth of God, wert thou to know that which I know, thou wouldst forgo the sovereignty of this world and of the next that thou mightest attain my good pleasure through thine obedience unto the true one. He's, the Bob is telling us that if we could see with his eyes, if we could know what he knows, that we would forego the sovereignty of this world and of the next. That in some sense it itself can actually be, once again, a trap, a snare, something that can draw us away from our true purpose in that world of God. If any man were to arise to defend in his writings the cause of God against his assailants, such a man, however inconsiderable his share, shall be so honored in the world to come that the concourse on high would envy his glory. No pen can depict the loftiness of his station, neither can any tongue describe its splendor. For whosoever standeth firm and steadfast in this holy, this glorious and exalted revelation, such power shall be given him as to enable him to face and withstand all that is in heaven and on earth. In this quote, Baha'u'llah is talking about the bounties and beauty of an individual who would stand up and actually defend the cause of God against those who would attack it. And he says that and such a soul would actually be given power that would enable him to withstand all that is in heaven and on earth. And once again, the same theme about why we would have to withstand something in heaven. And it says all those, as if, you will, there was in that world beyond individuals who were not in agreement that you would actually have to give proofs and arguments and teach. But this is exactly what we saw in the case of Mullah Ali Akbar, that there is teaching going on in the worlds beyond, adducing proofs from a prior revelation as we ascend through all the worlds of God, through all these revelations of God. And in this case, we are actually praying in all of these prayers to be able to make mention of God in each of these worlds, to defend his cause in each of these worlds, to have faith and assurance in each of these worlds. That we are really looking at a picture where we can, as we've seen, been, be in a hell in any world of God. One of the first uh, sections we did on this deepening was looking about how there actually is a heaven and hell in every world of God. That heaven and hell being defined as exception or rejection of the manifestation of God. 
We see now that that manifestation of God is in each of the worlds, which is why you can have a heaven or a hell in each world. We also have these prayers where we're asking to be released from attachment to the worlds into which we are entering. Such is my love for thee that I can fear no one, though the powers of all the worlds be arrayed against me. Alone and unaided I have, by the power of thy might, arisen to proclaim thy cause, unafraid of the host of my oppressors. I swear by God, I seek no earthly goods from thee, be it as much as a mustard seed. Indeed, to possess anything of this world or of the next world would, in my estimation, be tantamount to open blasphemy. For it ill beseemeth the believer in the unity of God to turn his gaze to aught else, much less to hold it in his possession. In this first quote from the Prayers and Meditations of Baha'u'llah, he says that he fears no one because of his love for God, though the powers of all the worlds be arrayed against me. That once again there can be powers arrayed against you in the worlds beyond. That you can, again, be teaching and deducing proofs. In the second one it says, Indeed, to possess anything of this world or of the next would, in my estimation, be tantamount to blasphemy. Why? Because a believer in the unity of God would not turn his gaze to aught else. So all around there are these, again from the quotes, these images of rubies and gold, these exquisite places that we're moving through, these many different valleys that we're actually traveling through, and all within them are these delectable fruits and wonderful things that we can be drawn towards. Yet they themselves can actually be distractions, even though some of those distractions being the arguments or perspectives of other individuals in those worlds, but that our job is to defend, adduce proofs like Mullah Ali Akbar, not be attracted to all these things, pray for detachment from that world just as we pray for detachment to this world, and seek out the manifestation of God in that world. And remember, as we previously uh, read, we must be wary because God may test us with the benefits of this world and of the next, in the words of the Bob. Indeed, shouldst thou desire to confer blessing upon a servant, thou wouldst blot out from the realm of his heart every mention or disposition except thine own mention. And shouldst thou ordain evil for a servant by reason of that which his hands have unjustly wrought before thy face, thou wouldst test him with the benefits of this world and of the next that he might become preoccupied therewith, and forget thy remembrance." So this next section is the world and the life to come defined. Know ye that by the world is meant your unawareness of him who is your maker, and your absorption in aught else but him. The life to come, on the other hand, signifieth the things that give you a safe approach to God, the all-glorious, the incomparable. Whatsoever deterreth you in this day from loving God is nothing but the world. Flee it, that ye may be numbered with the blessed. Should a man wish to adorn himself with the ornaments of the earth, to wear its apparels, or partake of the benefits it can bestow, no harm can befall him, if he alloweth nothing whatever to intervene between him and God. For God hath ordained every good thing, whether created in the heavens or in the earth, for such of his servants as truly believe in him. Eat ye, O people, of the good things which God hath allowed you, and deprive not yourselves from his wondrous bounties. Baha'u'llah defines the world as what? Your unawareness of him who is your maker, and the absorption in anything but him. And the life to come, on the other hand, it says, signifieth the things that give you a safe approach to God. Baha'u'llah then goes, very clearly states, that these beauties in each of the world of God are meant for your adornment. They're meant for your enjoyment. The wonders of this world are meant to be enjoyed. And they should be, as long as they alloweth nothing whatever to intervene between oneself and their God. 
and that every good thing that he hath ordained in every world of God is actually for this purpose. Simply that the world, in any world of God you're in, is defined as that which draws you away, that which can actually distract you, that which can become more of a focus than the true, the good, the just, and the beautiful, and that the life to come signifies the things that give you a safe approach. So when we are fulfilling in our life that which draws us closer to God, that is the life to come. That is heaven. Whenever we are turning away, that is hell. And what is those things that is that true safe approach to God, that given that there is no direct intercourse, um, it is the manifestation of God in every world of God. That we can, uh, again, as the Bob said, ascend through these revelations, through the worlds of God, by seeking out his messengers, finding their, their message, and then embodying that which would be our heaven. Or turning away should we choose, and if distracted and attached to that which is in the world beyond, which becomes the world, or hell. This next section is called Finding Him, Smelling His Fragrance. And we begin with a quote from Baha'u'llah. Blessed is the man that hath acknowledged his belief in God and in his signs, and recognized that he shall not be asked of his doings. Such a recognition hath been made by God the ornament of every belief and its very foundation. Upon it must depend the acceptance of every goodly deed. Such is the teaching which God bestoweth on you, a teaching that will deliver you from all manner of doubt and perplexity, and enable you to attain unto salvation in both this world and in the next. In this passage, Baha'u'llah is telling us that we should acknowledge God and in his signs, and recognize that he shall not be asked of his doings. That he does not, if you will, have to conform to what we think he should do. And that somehow that this is the very foundation upon which our belief must be built. And that this will deliver us from doubt and enable us to attain salvation in both this world and the next. And it's really important here because it's saying there's a way that you attain salvation here and cannot attain salvation in the next world. And I would suggest if we look back through many of the studies we've done before, this can be vice versa. You can not attain salvation in this world, but you can make up for lost opportunities. You can actually find the manifestation of God in the next world, even when you did not hear. We were told this explicitly, and we've looked at this in previous studies. But here, what we're actually being told is we have to be very, very careful about how we might quickly judge a message from God, how we might quickly reject a message from God in the next world. And again, remember, it'll, it may enable you to attain salvation in this world and the next. So we could have found salvation, moved into the next world, and because we have not truly understood how God can manifest himself within each of these worlds, we actually can reject in the next world, and thus end up in hell. Say, From my laws the sweet-smelling Savior of my garment can be smelled, and by their aid the standards of victory will be planted upon the highest peaks. The tongue of my power hath, from the heaven of my omnipotent glory, addressed to my creation these words, Observe my commandments for the love of my beauty. Happy is the lover that hath inhaled the divine fragrance of his best beloved from these world words, laden with the perfume of a grace which no tongue can describe. By my life, he who hath drunk the choice wine of fairness from the hands of my bountiful favor will circle around my commandments that shine above the dayspring of my creation. The sweet-smelling savior of my garment, number four. This is an allusion to the story of Joseph in the Quran and the Old Testament, in which Joseph's garment brought by his brothers to Jacob, their father, enabled Jacob to identify his beloved long-lost son. The metaphor of the fragrant garment is frequently used in the Baha'i writings to refer to the recognition of the manifestation of God and his revelation. Baha'u'llah, in one of his tablets, describes himself as the divine Joseph, who has been bartered away by the heedless 
for the most paltry of prices. The Bab in the Kayumul Asma identifies Baha'u'llah as the true Joseph and forecasts the ordeals that he would endure at the hands of his treacherous brother. Likewise, Shoghi Effendi draws a parallel between the intense jealousy which the preeminence of Abdul Baha has aroused in his half brother, Mirza Muhammad Ali, and the deadly envy which the superior excellence of Joseph has kindled in the hearts of his brothers. So, in this quote from the Most Holy Book, Baha'u'llah says that from his laws, we can actually inhale the divine fragrance of the blessed beloved. So, from his teachings, we can actually smell the fragrance of God through them. This is a, an allusion, as we see, to actually the story of Joseph, um, in which the garment is brought to Jacob and he actually smells it and he can smell his son. And the fragrant garment refers to, as we're seeing from the notes from the Katabi Akdas, um, to refer to the recognition of the manifestation of God and his revelation. It's important to recognize this. Um, for now we're going to move on to another quote, which actually comes from the Book of Certitude. I swear by God, were he that treadeth the path of guidance, and seeketh to scale the heights of righteousness, to attain unto this glorious and supreme station, he would inhale at a distance of a thousand leagues the fragrance of God, and would perceive the resplendent morn of a divine guidance, rising above the dayspring of all things. Each and every thing, however small, would be to him a revelation, leading him to his beloved, the object of his quest. So great shall be the discernment of this seeker, that he will discriminate between truth and falsehood, even as he doth distinguish the sun from shadow. If in the uttermost corners of the east the sweet saviors of God be wafted, he will assuredly recognize and inhale their fragrance, even though he be dwelling in the uttermost ends of the west. He will likewise clearly distinguish all the signs of God, his wondrous utterances, his great works and mighty deeds, from the doings, words, and ways of men, even as the jeweler who knoweth the gem from the stone, or the man who distinguisheth the spring from autumn and heat from cold. When the channel of the human soul is cleansed of all worldly and impending attachments, it will unfailingly perceive the breath of the Beloved across immeasurable distances, and will, led by its perfume, attain and enter the city of certitude. Therein he will discern the wonders of his ancient wisdom, and will perceive all the hidden teachings from the rustling leaves of the tree, which flourisheth in that city. With both his inner and his outer ear, he will hear from its dust the hymns of glory and praise, ascending unto the Lord of Lords. And with his inner eye will he discover the mysteries of return and revival. How unspeakably glorious are the signs, the tokens, the revelations, and splendors, which he who is the king of names and attributes hath destined for that city. The attainment of this city quencheth thirst without water, and kindleth the love of God without fire. Within every blade of grass are enshrined the mysteries of an inscrutable wisdom, and upon every rose bush a myriad nightingales pour out, in blissful rapture, their melody. Its wondrous tulips unfold the mystery of the undying fire in the burning bush, and its sweet saviors of holiness breathe the perfume of the messianic spirit. It bestoweth wealth without gold, and conferreth immortality without death. In every leaf ineffable delights are treasured, and within every chamber unnumbered mysteries lie hidden. This quote itself is actually just such an exquisite one uh, for me, because it gives all these different images of what a seeker can attain. Um, and it's important because it says the seeker if they actually really, really, truly develop themselves, as it said, if he scale the heights of righteousness and attain unto the glorious and supreme station. So this is obviously an extremely exalted, if you will, station of being. 
degree of progress. At such a stage, if, if, if you will, the, the senses are actually cleared of the self, of the world, uh, we could inhale at a distance of a thousand leagues the fragrance of God. But what is that fragrance of God? That fragrance of God is his teachings. And the smelling of that garment, the, the inhaling of that fragrance, is actually finding the manifestation of God. He's then saying, if in the uttermost corners of the East the sweet savors of God be wafted, he will assuredly recognize and inhale their fragrance, even though he be dwelling in the uttermost ends of the West. We see that such an individual, if they scale the heights of righteousness and attain the supreme station, that they can actually distinguish the signs of God from the doings, the words, and the ways of men, even as the jeweler who knoweth the gem from the stone. Unfailingly perceive the breath of God across immeasurable distances. That this is the supreme station that an individual is trying to actually achieve, I'm going to propose if we actually read it, throughout the worlds of God, to reach a, such a station of refinement, such a station of actual sanctification, burning with the fire of the love of God, that they can actually inhale this fragrance from far away and find that manifestation of God. Because in each of the worlds of God, there is a manifestation of God waiting. There is a heaven, there is a hell. There is a series of things that can test us and draw us away. So we have to develop the senses. Again, this right back to the beginning, this concept of, of the embryo, the ability to develop the eyes, the ears, and the nose, the sense of taste, and the sense of actually mobility, the different virtues that enable us to do what? To move within the realms of God. Some of those things we have to develop being faith and assurance. The ability to discern the signs of God. This is the fragrance we're trying to truly be able to discern as quickly as we can in our process of evolution to the worlds of God. Help them then, O God, to reach forth through the power of thy sovereign might towards such a station that they can readily distinguish every foul smell from the fragrance of the raiment of him who is the bearer of the most lofty and exalted name, that they may turn with all their affections toward thee, and may enjoy such intimate communion with thee, that if all that is in heaven and on earth were given them, they would regard it as unworthy of their notice, and would refuse to cease from remembering thee, and from extolling thy virtues. It's really the same theme once again. It's that there is a station that we can actually reach, where, quote, we can readily distinguish every foul smell from the fragrance of the raiment of him who is the bearer of thy most lofty and exalted name. And this, in this very quote, it actually says, And they may enjoy such intimate communion with thee, that if all that is in heaven and on earth were given them, they would regard it as unworthy. So, if in the heavens above, in the worlds beyond, all those metaphorically rubies and gold were offered to you, you would actually smell the foul smell from the fragrance and separate that from the fragrance of the raiment of the manifestation of God, the divine Joseph, the one you need to find in that world of God. I entreat thee by the fragrances of the raiment of thy grace, which at thy bidding and in conformity with thy desire were diffused throughout the entire creation. I testify that through him the pen of the Most High was set in motion, and with his remembrance the scriptures in the kingdom of names were embellished. Through him the fragrances were wafted, and the sweet smell of thy raiment was shed abroad amongst all the dwellers of the earth and the inmates of heaven. So in this first quote, we actually see that the, the fragrances of the raiment of God's grace, that raiment, that robe, being the analogy for the manifestation of God, were diffused throughout the entire creation. And then it says uh, that through him the pen of the Most High was set in motion, and with his remembrance the scriptures in the kingdom of names were embellished and that the fragrance were wafted amongst all the dwellers of earth and the inmates of heaven. And I was just, again, if we look at these, these texts closely, this is because the fragrance of the manifestation was actually 
wafted throughout all the worlds of God, and in all those worlds of God there are scriptures upon which their names are embellished. That these are that which we are seeking, which sorts between whether or not we are in the hell of that world or the heaven of that world. And it is this capacity that we are seeking to actually discern through our ascent to the divine blood. This next quote simply tells us that is the fragrance that we actually derive from the manifestation of God, that we then can actually spread unto others in all the worlds of God. Empower them also, O oh my God, to be as the rain that poureth down from the clouds of thy grace, and as the winds that waft the vernal fragrances of thy loving kindness, that through them the soil of the hearts of thy creatures may be clad with verdure, and may bring forth the things that will shed their fragrance over all thy dominion, so that everyone may perceive the sweet smell of the robe of thy revelation. Once again, this is like in the story of Mullah Ali Akbar, when he is spreading the fragrances of God, or some of the quotes that we've seen about individuals teaching in the worlds beyond, they're spreading the fragrances. It is that fragrance that we get from the manifestation of God in that world, that musked scent that we actually then take on and then spread through. And that is actually the job to be a lamp unto others, to actually be uh, that which actually enables them, and through learning ourselves, to discern the fragrance of the Beloved from a thousand leagues away. This is why we are told in the Most Holy Book, Consort with all religions with amity and concord, that they may inhale from you the sweet fragrance of God. So why is it that we consort with individuals of all faiths? Because in my understanding, according to the Baha'i writings, once we have gone through the Valley of Search, once we have actually sought out the Divine Beloved, and we actually get that sweet-smelling savor, that fragrance from his laws and from his person, we then, if we, if we embody his teachings, if we truly move into layers, if you will, of higher heavens, of subtleties, of seeking the greatest expression of his teachings, that fragrance comes off us unto others and enables them to, if they are actually open to it, smelling that fragrance and running towards him. And that that in itself enables us to more deeply understand him and in such a way be able to find him in the worlds beyond. It is this topic of finding the manifestation of God in every world that gives us our definition, I believe, of what we really mean by everlasting life. Thus, spirituality is the greatest of God's gifts, and life everlasting means turning to God. It is something that actually stands out uh, interestingly, even within much of the Judeo-Christian scriptures, it will say that uh, one is giving everlasting life, right? Or given eternal life. Yet in such pictures, often there is uh, a problem we will look at in the future, uh, seemingly an eternality of hell. So life cannot mean continued existence. Uh, if hell were eternal, if you're a Christian or if you're a Muslim, um, it, it, it itself cannot mean uh, meaning everlasting life cannot mean actually just everlasting existence. It necessarily means some different concept of life. And we were just looking at a quote recently of the life to come is that which secures our safe passage to the Beloved. That is finding his fragrance. That is actually finding that vehicle for the transmission of his grace and of divinity itself in all the worlds of God. That uh, his message being sent down in all the worlds of God in the form of a prophet. And this is the thing, is that, again, I believe <laughs> that when we look at the concept of everlasting life within the writings, what is that? It is that prayer that we are making in the long obligatory prayer, that we might make mention of him in every world of his worlds, that we might be able, through the development of our spiritual capacities, our virtues, our seeking him to find that divine being, that divine messenger, in each of the worlds of God. An analogy that often comes uh, to mind when I think about these things is actually the finding of a loved one in a different place. I remember once I was actually in my hometown and I was walking across the bridge. I went over a large river in my hometown and it was nighttime actually. And I was actually crossing over just the crest of the bridge and several hundred yards away, uh, I looked over and I said, oh, there's my friend Dave. 
And now this was Dave. But I reflected on it. I said, well, how strange is that? Because this individual is several hundred yards away. How did I know that this was my friend? I can't see his face. And it was because I could see the way he walked. Because I was so used to being around this friend of mine that I got to know just the way he walked. It makes me think, if you will, of Qudus seeing the Bab walking through the market of Shiraz, where suddenly he saw this is a being that I know, in that case being a divine recognition. And I think often, um, say for example, I'm trying to actually find a friend of mine, and I know this individual very, very intimately. I know his ways. I know his loves, his cares. I know the things he likes to do, the things he likes to eat. I've become, if you will, enamored with this friend of mine and the realities of his person. Well, if you were to actually take me and say it's my friend Shahruz, my friend who actually does the cutting of these videos, say my friend Shahruz is actually suddenly somewhere in Beijing, and I actually have to find him, and you don't know Shahruz, and you have to find him. When we have a race to see who can actually discover uh, where Shahruz is, I was just obviously I'm going to win. I can know the ways he walks. I can see in my mind's eye the places that he might go, the kinds of concerts he might go to, whether or not he would go to a museum or not, if we would go to a dance show. And I can begin scouring that massive city <laughs> for this dear friend of mine because I know his ways. And this is the thing, is, is I, I believe if we really reflect on what actually is the process of what we are supposed to do here within this life, which is to read the Word of God, to express His virtues, His attributes in our own life, we begin to see more and more that we smell His fragrance. That we actually, when we look at the Scriptures and see what the mind of the Divine Being is like, we can really come up with a different, if you will, a rich, rich picture of what this Being is like, so that when we move into the next world, we can find Him again. This is one of the reasons why I believe it's so um, vital to actually recognize the manifestation of God in his most recent expression. For example, I myself read the New Testament. I read the Old Testament, the Hebrew Bible. I read the Quran. I read the Buddhist writings. I read the Hindu writings. All through the lens, of course, of, of being a Baha'i and reading the writings of the Bab and of Shoghi Effendi and of Abdu Baha, there is constantly an, an enrichment of, if you will, the fragrance and the character of this divine being. How this divine being manifests itself within this realm. And yet, what have we seen when, when we move into the next world, and the next world, and the next world, and the next world, there will be his fragrance somewhere in that world, and we will have to find him. For as we know, there is a manifestation of God in each world, there is a heaven and a hell, and we can become attached to the world that we're in. The following quote brings up a question. These verses of the Torah have therefore numerous meanings. We will explain one of them, and will say that by Adam is meant the spirit of Adam, and by Eve is meant his self. For in certain passages of the sacred scriptures where women are mentioned, the intended meaning is the human self. By the tree of good and evil is meant the material world, for the heavenly realm of the spirit is pure goodness and absolute radiance, but in the material world light and darkness, good and evil, and all manner of opposing realities are to be found. As to the second question, the tests and trials of God take place in this world, not in the world of the kingdom. So in these two quotes, um, there seems to be a problem, <laughs> uh, put simply, because it seems to say that the tree of the good and evil, in the first quote, is meant the material world, for the heavenly realm of the spirit is pure goodness. Uh, but the material world is light and darkness, good and evil, and these opposing realities. And then in the second quote from Selections and the Writings of Abdu'l-Baha, it says, uh, the tests and trials of God take place in this world, not in the world of the kingdom. So we generally have some work to do. Why? Because, listen to the following quote. In regard to your question concerning evil spirits and their influence upon souls, Shoghi Effendi wishes me to inform you that what is generally called evil spirit 
is a purely imaginary creation and has no reality whatever. But as to evil, there is no doubt that it exerts a very strong influence, both in this world and in the next. Abdu'l-Baha, in some answered questions, gives us a thorough and true analysis of the problem of evil. You should preferably refer to that book for further explanation on that point. And it seems... Clearly, in the Selections Writings of Abdu'l-Baha, he says the tests and trials of God take place in this world, not in the world of the Kingdom. As well, we have a, if you will, almost a countertext, where the Guardian himself is stating that evil exists both in this world and in the next, and exerts a strong influence. So we seem to have, if you will, a conundrum of a series of texts that seem to balance off each other and cause, you know what I mean, almost a tension. What is happening? Well, we did actually read a quote just recently where the world, where the opposing realities exist, is defined as whatever actually draws us away from the divine. And the life to come is whatever actually pulls us and secures our safe journey towards the divine. So in the world of the kingdom, possibly one conception is, is that in the life to come, which is the teachings of the manifestation of God, there are no tests and trials we can actually advance towards. Whereas the world itself, where you have these opposing realities, is those aspects of the domain and state, state of existence that we're in that can actually draw us away. As well, we have an issue that might arise as we continue on, which is there seems not to be one single concept or structure, if you will, in the worlds beyond. There is uh, what is often termed Malakut, the realms, if you will, of the angels, and there is such a thing called Jabrut, which is the realm of power. What I believe is usually referred to as the Crimson Arc, or for example, the Kingdom. That there are stages of reality that one can, but not necessarily will, achieve and attain within one's journey back to the Divine. But we'll have to wait on this for a little couple more quotes to come. The two heavens, or earth, heaven and that which lieth in between. All praise be unto thee, O God. Thou art the maker of the heavens and the earth, and that which is between them. And thou in truth art the supreme ruler, the fashioner, the all-wise. Glorified art thou, O God. Thou art the creator of the heavens and the earth, and that which lieth between them. Thou art the sovereign Lord, the most holy, the almighty, the all-wise. We will no doubt do a study of the themes that actually arise in this section uh, much more deeply in the future. But what we can see is that there is, in these two quotes from the Bahab, there is the heavens, the earth, and that which lieth between them. As I said, you often encounter concepts of the inmates of the All-Highest Paradise, or for example, the companions of the Crimson Ark. Um, we seem to have, I think unequivocally, a series of structures or stations within the next world beyond. And there is that which lieth in between heaven, the heaven of kingdom and earth. This is, I believe, when we look at certain concepts within the Baha'i writings surrounding the Kingdom, the Crimson Ark, the All-Highest Paradise, and those who will circle around thy mighty throne, we find that there is those things which in many different faiths actually correspond to what we would call Nirvana, or Moksha in Hinduism. That true heaven, if you will, the true, true heaven, those divine realms far above the normal worlds of God beyond this. Uh, in Buddhism, I believe, you start really getting into this when you start looking at what are called the dhyanas, the realm of infinite space, the realm of infinite consciousness, emptiness, and the realms of neither perception nor non-perception. Again, a theme we will look at in the future. It's that you're looking at these, this world that you're in now, in this truly, truly rarefied area, which is the ultimate goal and purpose of human existence. One that we can only begin to crack open and understand when we begin to study Baha'i cosmology, the structures of the realms of reality beyond this one. And that it's in this kingdom, the world of the kingdom, 
the kingdom of revelation, that there are no tests and trials at the very end. Whereas in the many worlds in between, we actually do have to pray for detachment from even what is in those worlds, and we actually have to adduce proofs, as Mullah Ali Akbar did. We actually have to seek out the divine being, the manifestations of God, in those worlds beyond. It is in this uh, most highest heaven, the kingdom of revelation, as opposed to the kingdom of creation, that we actually truly hear of meeting the prophets of God. This quote is from Baha'u'llah. Blessed is the soul which at the hour of its separation from the body, is sanctified from the vain imaginings of the peoples of the world. Such a soul liveth and moveth in accordance with the will of its Creator, and entereth the all-highest paradise. The maids of heaven, inmates of the loftiest mansions, will circle around it, and the prophets of God and His chosen ones will seek its companionship. With them that soul will freely converse, and will recount unto them that which it hath been made to endure in the path of God, the Lord of all worlds. Again, we're talking about, it seems self-evident, a very, very rarefied soul. Someone who is sanctified from the vain imaginings of all the people of the world. A being that liveth and moveth in accordance with the will of its Creator, that the will of its Creator really is the essence of this person. And they enter what? They enter what is called the All-Highest Paradise. There, and the inmates of the loftiest mansion, the maids of heaven, then come out, and they will, what? Seek his companionship. That they will freely converse and recount what they have been made to, do, made to endure in the path of God. So there is a place in the all-highest paradise, in the all-highest kingdom, where a being can reach a station which I believe we will see is the ultimate goal of human existence. To get to a place where the testing and trials of God in the realm of discerning his manifestations has actually ceased. This is in the all-highest paradise when in the final stage we recount that which we have been made to endure in the path of God. Such pictures are insanely rich <laughs> within the by writings, and there are hundreds and hundreds of passages scattered throughout the writings that relate to this, if you will, crimson arc that we can actually enter. And we will look at those in the future. One thing we do know is that we will, in the worlds beyond, have the ability to attain to this experience of seeing the prophets of God. Here from Shoghi Effendi. We will have experience of God's Spirit through His prophets in the next world. But God is too great for us to know without His intermediary. The prophets know God. But how is more than our human minds can grasp? We believe we attain in the next world to seeing the prophets. This next quote is a quote from the World Order of Baha'u'llah. It is something that we will actually have to hold off for studies in cosmology, the realms and stations of all the world beyond. But for now, it's important to actually hear it. This is Shoghi Effendi from the World Order of Baha'u'llah. In confirmation of the exalted rank of the true believer, referred to by Baha'u'llah, he reveals the following. The station which he who has truly recognized this revelation will attain is the same as the one ordained for such prophets of the house of Israel as are not regarded as manifestations endowed with constancy. He is telling us that one who hath truly recognized will attain the station for the prophets of the house of Israel as are not regarded as manifestations endowed with constancy. We will once again have to look, wait, sorry, for a deeper study of this subject. But these, I would suggest, is what we call the Lesser Prophets, which themselves have a unity, as we will see within the writings of Shoghi Effendi, and that the ultimate destiny of an individual is to attain the station of, again, such prophets of Israel that are not endowed with constancy, the Lesser Prophets that we see within the Old Testament. 
I believe it is only here, which I believe we can see through the writings of the Buddha and through the Hindu writings, that this is the real state of nirvana, the real state of moksha, or the fana al-fana, <laughs> the extinction of extinction in Islam, where a being finally attains their ultimate destiny. But once again, we will have to wait for a future lecture to actually explore this more deeply. Know thou of a truth that the soul, after its separation from the body, will continue to progress until it attaineth the presence of God, in a state and condition which neither the revolution of ages and centuries, nor the changes and chances of this world, can alter. It will endure as long as the kingdom of God, his sovereignty, his dominion and power will endure. So in this quote, we're told a very peculiar thing. <laughs> One that we're going to progress until it attaineth the presence of God in a state and condition which neither the revolution of ages and centuries nor the changes and chances of this world can alter. So we progress through, and at the same time there is a static nature that is actually happening because it actually cannot be changed the revelations, revolution of ages and centuries nor the changes and chances of this world. But it will endure as long as the kingdom of God. What is happening here, I believe again, is that we're looking at the process in the next world where the soul takes on, as we are told in the writings, a body. A body commensurate with a degree of sanctity, of service, of love and sacrifice, and of seeking him that we have actually done in this life. That soul is embodied in the next world. And that world that he comes into or she comes into within that body, that is the body that is used to actually seek out the divine. And nothing of the ages of centuries and turning of time or the changes and chances of this world can't change that. But that itself seeks the divine being in that realm, in that vehicle. Whether or not they actually develop, we know that there is an infinite series of worlds of gods, sorry, worlds of God, and that what one achieves within this world or the world right beyond is actually what gives us the body for the next. If you will, the image of our true spirit is reflected in our own mirror all throughout the different worlds of God. That that body, that image that we are given is in accordance with what we had done in a previous world and either allows us to better or prevents us from doing as much as we could in finding the divine being in that world. This is the process of our journey back to God, which actually enables us to actually express our own free will, do as we choose. Yet at the same time, the judgment is the body that we're given, that body that we're given with the sense organs of that baby coming out of each of these fetuses, actually enables that being to move throughout that world of God and, if you will, either benefits or handicaps them in their capacity to actually find the divine being. That manifestation in each of the worlds of God. This is why, in some sense, there's a staticness to each world of God, but there is a constant progress all the way through. You have asked why it was necessary for the soul that was from God to make this journey back to God. Would you like to understand the reality of this question just as I teach it? Or do you wish to hear it as the world teaches it? For if I should answer you according to the latter way, this would be but imitation and would not make the subject clear. The reality underlining this question is that the evil spirit, Satan, or whatever is interpreted as evil, refers to the lower nature in man. The spacer, the spacer nature is symbolized in various ways. In man there are two expressions. One is the expression of nature, the other the expression of the spiritual realm. The world of nature is defective. Look at it clearly, casting aside all superstition and imagination. If you should leave a man uneducated and barbarous in the wilds of Africa, would there be any doubt about his remaining ignorant? God has never created an evil spirit. 
All such ideas and nomenclature are symbols expressing the mere human or earthly nature of man. It is an essential condition of the soil of earth that thorns, weeds, and fruitless trees may grow from it. Relatively speaking, this is evil. It is simply the lower state and baser product of nature. It is evident, therefore, that man is in need of divine education and inspiration, that the spirit and bounties of God are essential to his development. That is to say, the teachings of Christ and the prophets are necessary for his education and guidance. Why? Because they are the divine gardeners who till the earth of human hearts and minds. They educate man, uproot the weeds, burn the thorns, and remodel the waste places into gardens and orchards where fruitful trees grow. The wisdom and purpose of their training is that man must pass from degree to degree of progressive unfoldment until perfection is attained. For instance, if a man should live his entire life in one city, he cannot gain a knowledge of the whole world. To become perfectly informed, he must visit other cities, see the mountains and valleys, cross the rivers, and traverse the plains. In other words, without progressive and universal education, perfection will not be attained. Man must walk in many paths and be subjected to various processes in his evolution upward. Physically, he is not born in full stature, but passes through consecutive stages of fetus, infant, childhood, youth, maturity, and old age. Suppose he had the power to remain young throughout his life. He then would not realize the meaning of old age and could not believe it existed. If he could not realize the condition of old age, he would not know that he was young. He would not know the difference between young and old without experiencing the old. Unless you have passed through the state of infancy, how would you know this was an infant beside you? If there were no wrong, how would you recognize the right? If it were not for sin, how would you appreciate virtue? If evil deeds were unknown, how could you commend good actions? If sickness did not exist, how would you understand health? Evil is non-existent. It is the absence of good. Sickness is the loss of health, poverty, the lack of riches. When wealth disappears, you are poor. You look within the treasure box, but find nothing there. Without knowledge, there is ignorance. Therefore, ignorance is simply the lack of knowledge. Death is the absence of life. Therefore, on the one hand, we have existence. On the other, non-existence, negation of our, or absence of existence. Briefly, the journey of the soul is necessary. The pathway of life is the road which leads to divine knowledge and attainment. Without training and guidance, the soul could never progress beyond the conditions of its lower nature, which is ignorant and defective. This final quote in this section of study is a response by the Master to this great beyond, this great journey through the great beyond. He tells us that there is this um, lower nature of humankind, and that that lower nature is attached to the world. Remember that world defined by Abdu'l-Baha is that which draws us away. It actually is attached to and seeks and craves, if you will, in the Buddhist notion, those sensory expressions, those sensory delights. So it seeks this earthly nature of man seeks to do this. And the goal of the journey, and the, really the goal of the entirety of existence, is for us, through the expression of our own volition, to seek out the good, the true, the just, and the beautiful, represented in the manifestations, teachings unto humankind, to seek that out and embody them, and ascend beyond that material world into the life to come that expression of the divine being which enables 
us to free ourselves from the fetters of this world. But we are told that it is only through passing from degree, quoting passing from degree to degree, a progressive unfoldment until perfection is attained. That's our goal, that it's if we would live our entire life in one city, we cannot gain knowledge of the whole world. That it is through our process of really knowing darkness that we understand light, of knowing poverty that we understand wealth. It is through our moving through these different worlds of God that the development of our intellectual, emotional, and spiritual faculties truly gets to be expressed and tested and strengthened. That it really is, if you will, this wondrous journey placed before every soul to move throughout all the realms of God and freely choose, if they wish to, seek his fragrance, to find the divine being, or to turn aside. God always allows us, and it is through this journey that we understand all the, if you will, the valleys, the mountains, the rivers, the, and the plains, to explore all the worlds of God and all the fruits of his creation, to more increasingly and increasingly understand the divine being and draw closer to him through his manifestations. This is why he says, unless you pass the state of infancy, how would you know this was an infant beside you? If there were no wrong, how would you recognize the light? If there were no sin, how would you appreciate virtue? And I think we can actually see that throughout all the realms of God, through all these different stages and grades of, of reality, the refinements that we're able to actually make within our craft of living, that uh, quote of that one compilation, the divine art of living, that we actually become, if you will, true musicians of ourselves, and able to really, really express the beautiful art of what it is through moving through all these different trains, through seeking out the divine from falling and then getting up again, from making mistakes and then reflecting upon them and developing that this really is the journey of human existence. This is why we have this great beyond, this endless vista of beauty and wonder, and yes, challenges and obstacles to be surmounted. I titled this deepening The Great Beyond because it is that question about what is beyond this life and the realities that we can actually understand about that domain or that realm of existence. At the same time, these, if you will, six explorations of a numerous quotes from the Baha'i Writings is actually only a small cross-section of what the Baha'i Writings contain. There is so much more that we could have studied, and that I believe the more and more writings we look through, and the more and more writings we actually have translated, the better the picture is going to become. And no matter what, uh, in this study much is left to actually be done, and even more so, I, I guarantee that I have made mistakes along the way in my understanding of the writings. Uh, this is inevitable. There's one beautiful quote I'd like to share uh, from Shoghi Effendi, the guardian of the Baha'i Faith. There is no limit to the study of the cause. The more we read the writings, the more truths we can find in them. The more we will see that our previous notions were erroneous. So as the guardian says, there's no limit to the study of the cause. The more we read, the more truths we find. And, but I love this. The more we will find that our previous notions are erroneous. I know myself, I've been stumbling and attempting to understand the Baha'i Faith and the various world religions um, for about 20 years now. And I consistently come upon things even within, my own, within our own writings, um, constantly, where I realize, no way, I, I didn't know that. Or, I used to think this, and now with this quote, I can't think that anymore. Uh, I've often said to friends that if you're studying the Baha'i Writings, and you're trying to do your best to do it, you're going to consistently find that you were wrong. And that's what this quote is saying, that it really is an ocean that we need to dive into and do our best to understand. So of course, there are many misunderstandings derived from me in these series of videos, and pretty much any video that I will share. <laughs> what is the picture that we've seen? We've seen the womb and the world beyond. Um, that we are in this life, if you will, developing in an embryonic state that body which we will habit in the next world. That through our faith, our conduct, 
our service to our fellow man, we are developing the eyes, the ears, the senses, and the body that we will move in the next world with. That we've learned that we have to be detached from this world, but we also in the study looked that we actually have to be detached from that next world. For it is a glorious and wonderful and beautiful place that actually could lead us astray. We find that it's not that there is the next world is in some other place, but rather it is more like the in one the world in which we live, there might be the mineral, the plant, the animal, and the human all within one room, but each of those kingdoms not fully aware or not aware at all of the other kingdoms in that domain. Now that is actually the state that we are in. In a sense, in an analogy, we are the plant in someone else's living room. We find that when we move into the worlds beyond, that actually they don't end. They are uh, countless. Infinite range and countless. And that in each of these worlds, there is a heaven and there is a hell. That heaven is defined as finding the will of God and the message of God in that world, and then subsequently, upon recognizing it, seeking to embody it to the best of our ability within the short time of span that we have. But we're told explicitly by Abdu'l-Baha that that same concept of heaven and hell exists within the worlds beyond. That there too, we also learned, that there is a revelation in every world of God sent down in the form of a prophet, as a vehicle for his infinite grace. And as we move into that world, with our new eyes, our new ears, our new body, made up of those heavenly elements, that we then actually have to be able to discern the fragrance of God's manifestation, seek out that long-lost Joseph, and find him in his new attire. Once we've done that, it's the same process. We strive to actually share the truth that we know, and in whatever faltering and stumbling way we can, and try our best to actually bring our life into accord with the teachings of the manifestation of God for that day. So we move from one body to another, from world to world, seeking out the manifestation of God, but not necessarily always finding Him. This picture that we actually see uh, has sort of a, if you know those gestalt pictures, that if you look at them in one way, they look like a duck, and if you look at them in another way, they look like a rabbit. Or there's ones where, say, it looks like a beautiful young woman, but at the same time, if you look at it another way, it suddenly looks like an old woman. Um, I think many aspects of the teachings of the great world religions, including the Baha'i faith, have that, that, that effect. And this is one of those cases. Because I myself was raised within a Christian and then secular uh, environment. Um, and it's like I would hear the, the idea, for example, of going to heaven, of living out a brief span of life, maybe 70, maybe 20 years within this world, and say, you know, finding Jesus, for example, and then I move into the next world and I, if you will, rest on those laurels for all eternity. There's a sense in which that was uh, sad for me. Um, because the, that's it. Like the, not even the fact that someone might not get much of a chance, but rather that that's the end of it. Now, of course, one would say, but you live out a life in bliss and, and, and wonderment and the beatific, beatific vision of, of God. And that is exquisitely beautiful if you think of it in a certain way. At the same time, there is this, there was this aspect for me where I'm like, okay, well, but th there's no more achieving. There's no more seeking. There's no more striving. There's no more quests, there's no more adventure. But on the flip side, that's actually the beauty of the concept of actually attaining heaven. Right? You've actually won the prize. But the same goes for the other perspective, because we see this notion, and, I, and I, I'm assuming for many people it's obvious, that um, the Baha'i perspective, which has both a heaven and a hell, and they are, they seem from some people's perspective have gone away, but no, they truly are real. There is a real heaven and there is a real hell. It just depends what you mean by real. <laughs> but when you move to the actual other facets of it, which is this journeying through endless, if you will, a stacked ontology, a stacked series of realities that we move through, for many people, they look at this and they think, wow, that's, that's, that's actually refreshing, that's actually beautiful, we can make up for lost opportunities. 
And at the same time, there's this wonderful quest. There's this journey where we keep seeking and finding. It's as if you will, that constant chase and journey towards the beloved, where we see him in his new attire and find out something more about the divine being. And that's actually exquisite because that is that glorious vision of the divine that we get in flashes and pulses on our journey. But at the same time, that's samsara. <laughs> um, within the Eastern religions, within Buddhism and Hinduism, there's the concepts of samsara, which is the endless world of birth and death and rebirth. This sense in which it just never ends. <laughs> we are constantly seeking. And it actually can cause, if you will, a sort of uh, despair or sadness at the eternity of it. Of if, especially if you raised up in a system where you thought, well, you know, I achieved it. Right? I, you know, once I get the truth, once I find the truth, that's it, that it's over. I've, I've actually found ultimate truth. When rather, no, this is just one stage upon an endless journey. We cannot rest on our laurels in this life. Once we've recognized, we actually have to embody his teachings as the best we can. And it is through doing such a thing, through, if you will, polishing the mirror of ourselves to reflect the divine image, that we come to know him more and more and more, which enables us, once again, to find him. So there's a sense, really, really, in which you can look at the Baha'i, my understanding of the picture of the Baha'i afterlife, and it actually shifts back and forth. There is beauty, and sometimes there can be, it can be frightening to think that I would actually move into another world, having actually found the manifestation of God in my day, enter that world and actually miss him, not find him again. Or for the fact that I might actually find the, you know, the end of my life, that I'm suddenly in this wonderful place, and the experience is just exquisite, and there's so many new things, but in actual fact, I'm in a dung heap. <laughs> I'm actually, if you will, a sow in the mud, where I could have had so much more, but out of mercy, it's been actually kept from me. And then out of justice, that's where I am. This has both a, whew, I don't have to worry about it so much effect, but at the same time actually has sort of a scary effect. Because you can be in hell and not know it. And this is that sort of, if you will, <clears throat> shifting duck rabbit aspect of the Baha'i vision. And of course it gets more and more filled out the more we look at other quotes, and in addition, looking at the holy scriptures of Buddhism and Hinduism and Judaism, Christianity, Islam, Zoroastrianism, etc. On this notion of the justice and mercy, and this is something that I just mentioned, and, and actually just has an exquisite philosophical aspect to it, and I hope I can somewhat convey that to the best of my ability. It's that, how can God be just and both merciful? And the Baha'i picture, as it's been presented here, for me, actually really puts a fascinating spin on this. Because we've already touched on the motif, which is this sense veil, where when we actually die at the end of our life, we have been building this body in the next world, the eyes and the ears and the nose and the limbs, to be able to navigate that world. In my opinion, in my understanding of the writings, when a soul comes to the end of their life, they are, if you will, a being released from this cage and put in a glorious domain. And what I will propose to consider is, is that's true just about for anyone. That is a wonderful experience. There is a reckoning, a time when actually they actually realize their wrongs. But at the same time, they end up in a place with a body and a sense organs to be able to explore the realm in which they've, if you will, arrived. Once they do so, they, the analogy I gave is, someone might come up to them and begin talking about, say, colors, but they can't see them. That individual then begins to express, if you will, them through the modes of, say, temperature or texture, but they can't actually understand. There is this sensory veil. You cannot actually really communicate to somebody who cannot hear the beauty of Beethoven, the wonders of Mozart. Um, and this makes things very difficult, because I'm in that state because I've been given my just desserts, the justice of God. 
But in a strange sense, there is a mercy to it, because I'm actually shielded from what I don't have. But there's a further aspect we've also explored, which is imagine, and again I will say, I move into the next world after my death, and I haven't been that great of a person. But all of a sudden, I'm in a place that is wondrous. Expansive. I'm experienced, if you will, and you know, again, metaphorically, visual experiences I've never seen, colors I've never seen, music and sounds I've never heard, feelings and textures, a mobility that is shocking compared to, if you will, this you know, meaty cage <laughs> that I'm currently in. And all of a sudden I'm moving through these wonderful landscapes, these beautiful places, experiencing things I never could have experienced in this life. And I think, wow, like I, I made it. I'm in heaven, it's wonderful. And I tend, again, I suddenly encounter beings that are telling me it's not. You think this is wonderful, but it's not. It's actually a, a really unfortunate place you're in. And imagine how confusing this would actually be, and how hard it would be to believe that you're in a place that isn't that grand. Imagine even worse if an individual was telling you were in a horrible place. A place that would be, an analogy, like a dung heap or a pigsty. But you look around and it's exquisitely beautiful and wonderful. That is the justice and the mercy of God. We're placed in a place we deserve, but it itself is actually wonderful compared to the world in which, from which we have come. There is a sense in which I don't, I, sorry, there is a sense in which I do think we can make sense of this to a degree. Um, I think, for example, of someone who is like a millionaire playboy. Someone with lots of money, no cares whatsoever in the world, and really actually spends their life really doing nothing but enjoying the fruits of this world. They're not concerned with the welfare of others. At the same time, they don't disdain or hate others. They just move around drinking fine wines, eating fine food, flying from place to place, exploring as they wish. There's no experience um, and no, no sensual gratification that they cannot have. So as they move through this world, it is just sweet and delectable and perfumed and comfortable blankets and couches and beds. Um, now imagine someone coming up to them who has almost nothing and trying to communicate to that individual and saying, my friend, like, you're in a horrible place. And they look around and they see multi-million dollar homes, jets, the most perfect clothes, everything you could ever imagine. It would be difficult for them to understand. And all of a sudden this individual starts talking about the sweetness, right? of knowledge, or the, the, the silky soft ass of nature, for example, of solving a difficult problem, or of trying to actually let go of one's attachments and seeking peace, serenity, and wonder in the simple. Such a thing would be very, very difficult for that person to understand. But that's just someone who themselves isn't, hasn't, sorry, hasn't lived a life of great, if you will, darkness. Imagine if I myself am, instead of just a rich person, I am a drug dealer. I, in, I gave this example before. I've, I've, I'm selling methamphetamines, cocaine. I am actually have a human trafficking ring. I have a prostitution ring. In such a state, I have more power, more money, uh, and pseudo-respect, if you will, than you could ever imagine. And you come up to me and you start talking about justice and compassion and mercy. I don't just don't understand you. I, th I think it's completely foolish. I think it's nonsensical about what you're talking about. I am in a state which is heavenly from my perspective, which is perfect in power and sensuality and the any experience that I wish. This again is an analogy, <clears throat> I believe, for the next world. Um, even in the other example I gave previously, where you have an individual who is actually a drug addict, the idea of quitting, of giving up that drug, is itself a sense of torment, a horrible sense of torment, even if they still have some echoes, some, some faint memories of what it was like to be normal. 
when you begin to talk to this individual and you're asking them to quit and you're asking them to come home and you're trying to call attention to the nature of their, their being, which say is, I'm sorry, emaciated and scabbed, they often can react as, as if you are the dark one, as if you are being cruel or mean or self-righteous in a holier-than-thou state of being. But you're asking this individual to become whole. I think it's the same in the next world. That's what I personally believe. You can be in hell, as the Bob said, thinking you're in heaven. Because when you pass beyond, you're placed in an experience, in a landscape, with mobility and senses that you, you never had before. You are a bird released from its cage. However, from the standpoint of grades of being far above you, you are in a heaven of, say, a worm in a dung heap, or a beetle in the ground, or a sow or boar in the pigsty, a snake upon the ground. And yes, they are heaven for the snake, because the snake doesn't know better. They can't know of the wonders of the human intellect, or service to humanity, or compassion, or the, the, the wonders of actually solving difficult problems, or actually contributing, or... And I think this is actually what we're looking at. This is where the justice and mercy of God meet. He has mercifully gives us a wonderful experience, blocks from us that which is above us. But at the same time, that experience is very lowly compared to what we could have if we wish to strive. And that's his justice. And at the same time, where the veil where we can't see up is our mercy so we can enjoy where we are, it is also the veil of justice, which prevents us from truly understanding what we could have had. So it really has this, again, this, this sort of flipping duck-rabbit <laughs> uh, aspect to the study. So this study uh, of the afterlife in the Baha'i writings um, that I've presented here over six sections, with this being the conclusion section, is just in the hopes of trying to lay a series of foundational concepts so that we can actually move on to journeys in the future. That this is really, if you will, the, the core uh, of attempting to reach out and do our best to understand the pictures that we find within other scriptures. And I will suggest uh, uh, several issues here, because there are certain aspects that, um, without doing this study, we couldn't, I believe, we couldn't really start to get a handle on. Some of those things are related to what we would normally think of as the Eastern religions, and some of those of the Western religions. Um, one of the first one that pops up to mind is reincarnation. Um, there are many, several talks, sorry, uh, on, by Abdu'l-Baha on reincarnation that I suggest anyone read. Um, at the same time, anyone familiar with Buddhist writings or Hindu writings sees these motifs and pictures in it. I do believe if you start thinking about the picture that we've uh, presented here, that you will have quite a bit of, if you will, um, things you can use to unpack those pictures. Uh, because we do take on bodies, we do return to the world, if you will. But I do think that we have to really, really, really unpack these notions independently now that we've actually studied this, if you will, a general view of the Baha'i afterlife. But reincarnation is one of them. But there's also aspects of a sort of reincarnation or return that would actually have to be dealt with as well. Uh, a Example, I guess you would say a peculiar example that isn't often brought up, is the issue of John the Baptist in the New Testament, for example. Uh, Jesus Christ says he is Elijah. This happens in one famous case after Jesus Christ comes down um, on the Transfiguration. And there's a period where actually the apostles ask him, uh, but we thought Elijah was supposed to come first. And what Jesus Christ says is, if you would have it, like if you can receive it or understand it, uh, John the Baptist was Elijah. So there is a sense in which there is a return, but there isn't. Now there are large sections of the Book of Certitude by, by Baha'u'llah that actually deal with this issue, and we will bring those to bear. And I think even those themselves enable us to, if you will, better understand what is meant by reincarnation in the other scriptures. But again, that's to be unpacked later. Um, another one, or another, I can just rattle off three quickly. Uh, one is the concept of anatman. Uh, this is a doctrine in Buddhism, which 
seems to proclaim and is understood by many people to mean that there is no self. And it actually means no Atman. And Atman being taken as, if you will, the teaching that we found within the Upanishads and within the Hindu scriptures related to there being, if you will, a divine spark that is within each individual that is actually in some sense both a part and not a part of some greater Atman, that which is beyond all things. But this relates to our passage through um, into the next world. Um, it is as if you will a, you know, the analogy often given is, is a caterpillar reaching out from one leaf to another. This passage between that does somehow doesn't carry on uh, some essential aspect of us, but that that individual reaps, if you will, the rewards and punishments of the life that I have led, or I have not. <laughs> um, I only point this out because it's something we actually really have to consider independently, and this relates also to the concept of nirvana, if you will, the ultimate state of Buddhism, and how can that picture be squared with the picture that we see within the Baha'i writings. Um, same thing with moksha in, in Hindu thought, that final, if you will, the drop returning to the sea. How can we incorporate, given these relate to the ultimate goal of human existence, how can we incorporate this into a picture and utilize many of the concepts that we've seen here, as well as others, to bring to bear and bring forward this greater, beautiful picture that can bridge between the different faiths. So there are those within the Eastern tradition, but at the same time, there's aspects within the Western traditions we would have to address as well. One thing that may have actually jumped out at people uh, from a uh, Western background, uh, especially if you've been raised within Christianity or Islam for that matter, um, is that within the Judeo-Christian scriptures, it seems very clear that hell is eternal, that it never ends, that someone who actually achieves heaven has achieved heaven and that's the end of it. Someone who has actually rejected and lived a life of evil, they actually move into hell and that's it, it's eternal. <laughs> So there is an issue, I think, that really has to be addressed within the eternality of heaven and hell. Um, so we have the, as well, the general resurrection. Um, in a small way within the Old Testament, within the New Testament, and within the Quran, there are scriptures that seem to relate directly to a general resurrection of humankind. And what that could mean. And how does that play out into the, if you will, through time destiny of an individual soul? How can we unpack that? How can we understand that in light of the pictures that we have seen from the Baha'i writings and bridging, if you will, these beliefs um, by using also, if you will, Islamic, uh, Christian, and Jewish scriptures? So I hope uh, this uh, video series on the great beyond has offered some thoughts, uh, shared some scriptures, that you haven't seen before. Um, I hope that your studies continue and you critique much of what I've said and develop your own understanding. Please remember um, for the, both this lecture series and any in the future that you don't have to watch the entire video because there is an audio format that you can download in the description and as well the PDF with all the quotes if you wish to actually review them, all of them with citations. So thank you very much everyone. God bless.